exposed to the word of God they are empowered to number one reflect Christ in experience please pay attention number two they are empowered with the tools that make them walk in victory experientially it is one thing to know the potentials that are captured in the word of God as far as the victory of the believer is concerned but we must learn the ways of God that can make that victory written here to become a reality in my life and in your life are we together now I have always challenged believers that in addition to conforming to the image and the character of the Christ it is important that believers make progress in their lives that you are able to look at your life and know that you are moving from one level to the other psychologically speaking one of the indices that measure fulfillment is progress if and when you are unable to make constructive progress sooner or later you will be frustrated are we together so a conference like this is designed to help us and to lift us to remind us to renew our understanding to challenge us along the lines of new thoughts and um, I like for us to pay attention it will be a brief session tonight but I pray that it will be a meaningful one in the name of Jesus Christ two things very quickly generally there are two factors responsible for transformation it is called your teachability index number one is your willingness to learn and number two is your willingness to change these two factors are very important and they are responsible for the rate of transformation of any individual a measure of your ability to learn and your ability to change if you have a very high rate of your ability your passion to learn you are going to become very knowledgeable but if you do not have a passion to change you will become like the people in scripture who are ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth and i can tell you based on the authority of god's word it is very frustrating to know what should be and yet not enter into the experience of it it says now that you know these things happy are you if you do them hallelujah so as we hear the word of god it is important that we are very intentional about number one learning and then number two to allow the word of god permeate our spirits and to permeate our minds our thinking to challenge our philosophies and our ideas about life until we change and we sustain the mind of christ we will never be able to experience the realities that befit the mind of christ the bible says for as he thinketh in his heart so he is are we together yes i just thought to say that because sometimes um especially in conferences like this we can get very casual about the truths that come and we just open up our hearts for the sake of the ritual of reception with no intention to really receive it as a word from God and to be transformed. It is my um, plea, therefore, lending my voice with your pastor and the leaders in this great ministry, that we open up our hearts today very and, and be very intentional that the word that is coming is not just for, for um, awareness. It is coming from God to a man to me, to enlighten me and then to empower me to move to my next level if that is true for you shout amen. amen hallelujah praise the name of the lord and then while seated i like to speak over your life and then we'll pray as a way of um, starting this my discussion proper isaiah 54 and verse 17 I'm interested in the A part, Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. Please say amen. amen. Let me repeat it one more time that in the name of Jesus, no weapon that is formed or fashioned against you shall prosper. Well seated, can you turn it into a prayer in one minute that I decree and declare in this season? 
Go ahead and pray. This is a believing church. Decree and declare no weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. No weapon fashioned. No weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. No arsenal of darkness against my destiny, my advancement in this kingdom and this life will prosper. Fortified by the word of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Luke chapter 8. You are about to learn something tonight that I believe for many of us will be the bridge from the season where you are to the next season of your life and destiny in the name of Jesus. I truly believe with all my heart that as you open up your heart to learn, finally the Spirit of God will connect the dots for you and you will make maximum kingdom advancement even after tonight. Luke chapter 8. And I'll start my reading from verse 22. Luke 8, 22. Now it came to pass. You can look up his projector if you can see it. Now it came to pass on a certain day. Right. That he went into a ship. The he being Jesus. With his disciples. And he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And the Bible says, They launched forth. Uh -huh. Next verse. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. 24. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying unto one another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and the water, and they obeyed him. We'll pause here. Please go back to verse 22. The Bible lets us know that this is a very interesting, you know, a, a very interesting story. The Bible says it was on a certain day. So we know that this is not a parable. It happened a certain day. That Jesus came to the ship with his disciples. Before this time, he had made tremendous progress preaching the gospel holding his crusades, doing mighty and great things, miracles, signs and wonders. And he desired that they go to the other side. So you must understand how the story starts. The story starts with a desire to go over to the other side. Are we together now? And then the Bible says they launched forth with that motivation that he intended to go to the other side so that they could experience his power, his grace, his salvation. But then the Bible says that as they sojourned, certain things began to happen. Jesus lay to rest and there was a storm of wind. And there was a storm of wind. The first thing I want to say tonight is that there are times when challenges prove to you that you are getting it right. It is not always true that every challenge you face may be a proof that you are getting it wrong. The Bible says here that it was because of their desire to go to the other side. That means if they did not take the step to go to the other side, there would be no issue of storms at all. Hallelujah. There are times that the challenges and the storms that we face in our lives it may not be true that they are because we have backslidden or because we have not trusted God enough. In fact, many times those challenges come to prove that we are making progress in life. You would think that because Jesus was in the boat, a storm would not arise. Jesus did not join them. He started the journey with them. 
yet the storm still came. If the storm came for Jesus, it means it should not be unusual when storms come over believers. They did not ask him to join them when the storm started. He started the journey with them. In fact, he proposed the journey. The all-knowing God, the all-seeing God, now as a man, proposes a journey. Did he not factor the fact? Where was his vision? Where was his ability to see the end from the beginning? The storm seems to have taken them by surprise. They came to him and they said, we are disappointed. You are Jesus. Where was the grace that saw Nathaniel under a tree? That now we are on a journey and we are faced with a storm. Many times, just because God told you that you will go this way and you will be great, when you face challenges, most of us turn back as though the voice of God were supposed to magically exempt you from storms. The Bible here is teaching us, are we making progress now? The Bible is teaching us that even Jesus was not immune to the presence of storms. If the storm came with Jesus in the boat, then the storm can come with, to end making progress. Lord, why is this happening to me? Why is my business failing? Why am I not excelling in ministry? And we begin to ask these questions and the devil buys into our emotions to make us believe that we did not hear God. And you know, believers have a very interesting way of making people feel that whatever challenges that they have before them is proof that they did not hear well. Sometimes challenges are proof that you heard well. Are we together? So, they began their journey as proposed by Jesus himself. Let us go over to the other side. And the Bible says there was a storm of wind. Please look up. A storm is made up of um, two dimensions or two elements, if I would use that expression. Number one is water. Number two is wind. Please pay attention. It is the wind that powers the water to be boisterous. You may not be able to see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind in whatever happens with the water. Are we together? Now, that means that every storm has two sides to it. There is the water that you can see, the obvious problem that we are blaming. But there is a wind that you cannot see that is empowering that water. Are we together now? So that the issue is not just a rent issue. The issue is not just a business issue. The issue is not just your boss. The issue is not just your relatives. Oh, Joseph, the issue is not just the well. The issue is not just your brothers. That every storm is made of water and wind. Physical or visible and invisible. So in confronting storms, you are already in error if you focus only on the water. Are we together now? The first thing in addressing, because it, this scripture here is teaching us that it is not unusual to have storms, but it is also teaching us how to triumph over storms. That in dealing with storms, you do not start with water. When Jesus managed the storm, he started by rebuking the wind, the force that powers the water. Are you getting what I'm teaching you now? The simple but powerful teaching. Because you see, Satan is the master of the sense realm. And he knows that for as long as he keeps creating men and situations, they will distract you and you may not know that he is the force behind it. You will point fingers at individuals and the individuals may have legitimate blames, but that behind every storm, the real reason why the water is boisterous is the wind. The water is only a slave to the wind. The boss may only be a slave to a spiritual manifestation somewhere. This is why the Bible tells us 
that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Is God speaking to us now? That every time you are approaching issues of life and destiny, your first port of call should be the realm of the spirit. If you route it by any other agency, you will fail. Every storm is made of wind and water. Please say after me, wind and water. So just when the Lord tells you He's ready to manifest His power and glory over your life, you begin to have a misunderstanding with your wife that you cannot understand where it is coming from and where it is going to. That is water. There is a wind that is powering that. Spiritual men don't just talk physically. They know that what is happening is as a result of destiny. The moment you begin to find confusion around your life, it is proof that the realm of the spirit has, they have heard that you are going forward. Let us go over to the other side. The Bible says, John chapter 10 and verse 10, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill and to destroy. Look at me. That means before the thief comes, he vets whether there is something worth killing, what stealing that means the presence of the thief is proof you are that valuable now please understand this the thief has no business being in a place until there is treasure enough to steal treasure enough to kill and treasure enough to destroy could it be that his insistence over your destiny is proof that you are not even aware of what god placed in your own life Satan can be used as a confirmation that you are valuable. Are you learning tonight? So, let us go over to the other side in business. Let us go over to the other side in ministry. The other side as far as my pursuit for God and the things of the Spirit are concerned. And you begin that journey and here comes the storm. The storm is made of wind. Oh man of God, hear this. This may be a word for you. Oh businessman, hear this. This may be a word for you. The storm is not proof that your spiritual life has gone down. Don't let the devil lie to you. The storm, the quarrel in your home right now, it, it's not proof that you are not faithful. It's not proof. Many times it is because the devil wants to distract you so that you will go back. I can tell you if they made up their minds to go back, the storm would cease. The same energy it takes to go back is the same energy it takes to continue. Whether you go back or go forward, it will still take energy. We're dealing with Luke 8 now. And then the interesting thing is that the Bible says Jesus was sleeping. You don't want a savior to be sleeping during a storm. You want a savior to be alive. But Jesus was sleeping. And you would, thought, you, you, you would think that um, as, as boys, terrors as the storm was, he, it would wake him up. Jesus was still sleeping. That means, listen, this is very powerful. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Why will Jesus be sleeping in a boat that is raging left, right, and center? He did not wake up. He was sleeping. It took them waking him to say, Master, tell us not that we perish. Because he knew for sure that he would not perish. Are we together now? They never said, Jesus, wake up, your life is in danger. They said, we, we, there is something about your mentality that even the storm does not affect you. We know you are 45. You have your thinking, you have a mindset that will not allow storms to move you. But help us, have mercy on us. We are still trying to grow. Can I tell you this? There is a lesson here for everyone to learn. Two people were in the same storm. One sleeping, the other one shouting. Let this mind be in you. Sometimes you see people rejoice and praise the Lord until you share what they are rejoicing over. 
They are rejoicing over pain. They are rejoicing over disappointment. The man can be singing and clapping and there are bills to the billions to pay. He has received a mentality that God, God's, God's jealousy defends him and that there will be a way the end will be victory. This is how we think in the kingdom. Please understand this. We live in a world that is very passionate about attracting sympathy. And sometimes we, we tend to believe that just because we have justifiable reasons to feel bad, we can throw away everything and blame everybody and get angry. People do foolish things in society and justify it. Why did you steal? Well, there's poverty in the country. Why are you not serious? Well, there is no job. But Jesus had a mentality. This is the second thing I want us to learn. The first is about the reality of storms. That it happens to all men, including Jesus. And then number two, there was a mentality that Jesus had. Even in the midst of the storm, he was asleep. That looks to me like the scripture that says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Now here's the secret. For thou art with me. It didn't say for thou art talking to me. There are times that you don't have to wait for the storm to be calm to rejoice. Just verify if Jesus is there. The moment Jesus is there in the boat, begin to find rest. You can fail alone, but you and Jesus cannot fail together. If you are the only one in the boat... Even if you are a skilled man at sea, you begin to be afraid. But if you check that boat and you verify that Jesus is there, even if he is sleeping or seems to be sleeping, find rest. The first reason why we find rest in this kingdom is not because the storm is over. It is because Jesus is in the boat. Oh, this is, this is a prophetic word to someone right now. I may not know how the solution will come. I may not know what to do. I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I began a journey to start a business and now I'm in debt to the millions and the billions. And it was because of my desire to go to the other side. The other side of my destiny. I can't remain at this level. For the Bible says the path of the just is as a shining light. There are many people who do not have storms. It's not necessarily a proof of spirituality. It's proof that they are so cowardly they don't have the courage to go to the other side. Are we learning now? It takes courage. A storm must, must be sure that you are worth its attention to come to you. Now, learn this lesson. Number one, storms happen to all men including Jesus. It is not unusual. One of the scriptures that baffled me for many years is this statement in Revelation, and there was war in heaven. War in heaven. Heaven is your throne. With the all-seeing eye, omniscient, omnipresent, there was still war in heaven. Notice the character of God in both cases. God never stood up from his throne because of the war. He was still seated at rest. There was already a system put in place. Listen, learn this. Rest is proof of faith. Rest is proof of faith. You may need to prophesy to yourself. Say, myself, find rest. Myself, find rest. The Bible says, except the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord watches over a city, said the watchman watched but in vain. It is vain to wake up early and to sleep late at night, only to eat the bread of sorrow. But he gives his beloved sleep. Are we together? So there is a mentality that was in Jesus that I'm proposing to us. Every time you seem to not have control over the issues in your life, forget about the issues and verify in that boat, is Jesus there? 
He can be there as the prophetic word he gave you. He can be there as the word of God that you hold on to. Are we together now? Yes. This home now is three years, five years, six years. We are trusting God for children and it looks like children are not forthcoming. That is a storm. It was a desire to raise a generation of prophets and apostles who will frontier the kingdom. Now a storm has come. And all kinds of naysayers will be around you trying to discourage you to say go back. Remember what I told you. The same energy it takes to go back is the same energy it takes to continue. Jesus had a mentality. He was so at rest. And they tapped him and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish. Please give us the scripture. Verse, that will be verse 23 or 24. Luke chapter 8, verse 23 or 24. Luke chapter 8. Master, he says, carest thou not that we perish. And the Bible says, do you know The Bible says, verse 24 is the verse. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose. Jesus never told them one word until the storm was over. He didn't say, gentlemen, how are you just become? No, he turned to the wind. Not the water. Jesus addresses storms by starting with the wind the spirit the force from the realm of the spirit that brings that storm and he said peace another synoptic account says be still and there was a great calm and then he now turned to the people and said now that i'm done with the storm let me teach you something where is your faith he turns to the wind like someone is going to turn to the wind this night. That it is time for me to move forward and thou storm that is standing before me, manipulating things, acting as though it's a financial problem, acting as though it's a marriage problem, acting as though it's a health problem. Just when they say you are about to be promoted, you touch yourself and it looks like there is a growth somewhere and the devil starts telling you cancer. So this is how you are going to die. That is a storm. It is not the swelling. There is a spirit. There is a way that we deal with storms. Jesus is giving us a lecture that you deal with storms by rebuking the wind. You only rebuke what is alive. You don't rebuke what is dead. That means the wind had life and it could hear the force that is behind the tragedy the force that is behind that is causing an impedance to your journey can hear and if you know how to speak as a priest that storm can be calm you don't have to bother about the water let the wind seize its influence and the water will come back to normal. So the issue is not just a financial problem. The issue is not just a marital problem. The issue is not just job. The issue is not just your destiny help us forgetting you. There is wind that is making the water to be boisterous. But imagine the labor they would have gone through trying to look for a container to fetch the water out one by one. One, imagine you are trying to fetch it out and it's coming into the boat again. It would have killed them there. That's how many of us try to manage challenges. Now, Jesus is teaching us a lesson here. That for every storm, please pay attention. There is wind and there is water. And that you can stand in the name of Jesus Christ. And take authority over the wind. And you go to your office by the next day. And the same boss who vowed that you must leave this office. Comes to you and says, you know I've been thinking about you. Where did you say you come from? And now you know that that is water. Without the influence of the wind now. Are we together now? 
Verse 25. Jesus said to them, verse 25 now, Where is your faith? We'll continue our reading. And being afraid, they wondered, saying to one another, I'm reading from KJV, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and water, and they obey him. The Bible now says, they proceeded with their journey. Verse 26. The Bible says, and they arrived. Say, I must arrive. Oh, in spite of the storm, the Bible says they arrived. Just stop there. Don't rush. We are dealing with, this is scripture. This is good news. That regardless what they met on the way, the final thing is that they, and I prospered. And I went forward. Your story is not complete until this is captured in the story. So, when you are telling me about the challenges, I'm interested, but not as interested as this. I want to know, did you have the same power to arrive? Someone prophesy, say, I arrive. Say, I arrive. Hallelujah, I arrive. Financially, that, that destination, I arrive in the name of Jesus. You may laugh at me because you are watching the storm, but it's not over. I arrive in the name of Jesus. I arrive. I arrive. Regardless the naysayers. I arrive by the power of the Holy Spirit. In ministry, I make progress. I arrive. Financially, I arrive. Rejoice not over me, my enemies. I arrive. Not only me, my family will also arrive. Please sit down. And they arrived. How many of them arrived? All those who started. Not some. Let me use this to prophesy to someone. There will be no loss. When you started this journey, you started with your spiritual life. Your finances. Everything that started with you will also arrive. You will not leave your spiritual life in the boat. It will not fall by the wayside. Just because you want to make progress. Don't lose your spiritual life. Don't lose your finances. Don't lose your relationships. Don't lose your courage. Everything that started that journey should arrive also. It didn't say, and he arrived. And they... And my children arrived. And my company arrived. And ministry arrived. And my spiritual life arrived. Yes, I came from a family of idol worship, but I made up my mind to go to the other side. And, and on my way, for 10 years I made captivity, but I still... Turn it into a prayer in one minute. The grace that makes a man arrive. In the name of Jesus Christ. You're going to be seated, but I'd like you to pray. I just felt that there, this is a place to declare. The grace, I arrive. I arrive. This one thing I do. Forgetting the things that are behind, I press onto, towards the mark of the high calling in Christ. I arrive. I arrive. I didn't start the journey to die in the sea. I didn't start the journey to bow to storms. I didn't start the journey in ministry to bow to pressure. I didn't start the journey to bow to status quo. I started intending to arrive. And until I see the other side, I am not yet there. There was a level of the anointing when I began my pursuit for God. You are praying. Hallelujah. Please look up. Hear me. Until you can see the other side, don't stop moving. I arrived does not mean I stopped when I was tired. I arrived does not mean I stopped because time was going. I arrived means I finally saw physically what was in my spirit when I started. Are we learning? Please sit down. Let's finish up that scripture. I'm just walking you through these scriptures. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. Now, next verse. <laughs> and when he went forth to the land, 
there met him out of a city a certain man now you would think that when he was done with storms he would never meet any again as soon as he arrived the new level it was not the prime minister who came to greet him as soon as he arrived there he was a madman who stood there and the bible says he had devils long time and wear no clothes neither abode in any house but in tombs my first question is who told the madman there were people coming from the other side i i can perceive a relationship between the storm and the demons in this man That as soon as he arrives, he meets the madman who is also like the water and the wind. In this case, the man being the water, the wind being the spirit that had kept him bound for a long time. Follow the discourse. Next verse, please. And the Bible says, and when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and with a loud voice said, what have you, what have i to do with thee jesus thou son of god most high i beseech thee torment me not 29 for he had commanded the unclean spirit you see the formula again not the man every time you see storms whether in human forms whether in whatever the approach is the spirit first jesus did not reply the man like he did not reply the man he did not reply the water he went straight to the wind the spirit component in that situation and the bible says he rebuked he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man then the bible gives us added information that for oft times it had caught him and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters and he broke the bands and was driven of them of the devils into the wilderness uh-huh and jesus asked him now that he was free saying okay he's giving us an information what is thy name and he said legion because many devils were entered into him watch this and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep 32 watch this he says and there was there a herd of many swine feeding where on the mountain leave that for another day and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter them and he suffered them the word suffer means permit and the bible says and when the devils went out of the man they entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and were choked and they that fed them saw what was done and fled and went and told it in the city and in the country read on then they went out to see what was done and came to jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed sitting at the feet of jesus clothed and in his so what kind of mind did he have before because the Bible says that he was sitting in his right mind and they were afraid. 36. They also which saw it told them by the means that he was possessed of the devil was healed. The means that he was possessed of the devil was healed. Next verse. I want to bring out a powerful lesson here. Now watch this. Then the whole multitude of the country of the gatherings round about besought him to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. 38. Now, the man of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away with an instruction. What was the instruction? 39 return to thy house and show how great things god had done unto thee and he went his way watch this and published throughout the whole city how great things jesus had done to him jesus said now that we've done this let's return back so why did they really start the journey all the storms to free one man 
who was equal to ten cities? Now, it's very interesting when you study scripture that many times you would see Jesus preached in a large crusade. Then he would be with one person investing the same passion. That means in the mind of Jesus, he looks at things from a destiny dimension. That that one man was the evangelist anointed. Now, from hindsight, let's reverse the story. Story, story. Once upon a land called Gadara. Once upon a time, a land called Gadara. God intending to invade that land decided to invest his dream in a man and Satan knowing that that man could save the city now turned that man he made he, he, he started attacking the background of that man and eventually the evangelist that was anointed to save ten cities was staying in tombs with no clothes are you getting it now? Jesus Intending to save the gatherings, had to inconvenience himself to move to the other side. The spirits, knowing that salvation was coming, they did not see Jesus. They did not see the disciples. They saw salvation coming, not to the man, to the city. Hold on. Do you notice that there were certain people that suffered as a result of that salvation? That meant that they were prospering because of the bondage in the land. The moment the spirit went out, some people's businesses went down. Oh dear. There were people who their prosperity was because there was no salvation in that land. The economy was rising because the purposes of God were bound. As soon as the man was released, the spirit and those in allegiance to it went down. No other person went down in that city. And Jesus intending to save his city. Could it be that the reason why Jesus also has been intentional about your destiny is because as he looks at you, he's not seeing you. He's seen a 90-year-old prayer that someone from your family prayed as a missionary and said, Oh God, raise somebody from this family who will wipe the tears of everyone. Raise somebody from this region. And Jesus has come in honor to that prayer. Whenever you think it is about you, look beyond you. Whenever you think the attack is about you, look beyond you. Whenever you think the salvation is about you, look beyond you. Every time God comes to you, He comes to you because of the destinies connected to you. Every time Satan comes to you, He comes to you because of the destinies connected to you. There are attacks that have no business happening to you if you were not connected to the kind of destiny you are connected to. The attacks have nothing to do with you. Don't take them personal. Satan is fighting many people through you. That's why the attack looks fierce. If it was about you, he would not waste his time on you. He looked at you, madam, and he saw an evangelist. He looked at you and he saw a prophet. He looked at you and he saw a kingdom financier. And he said, instead of attacking one million people, let's stop this woman from having a child. Let's stop this one from going forward. Is someone learning now? This is giving us spiritual intelligence as believers so that we can interpret things from the lens of the spirit, from the lens of prophecy, from the lens of destiny. Now you can rejoice in the office and they may not know why. This woman who has been insulted by everybody, why is it that the more they insult you, the more you rejoice? Tell them I came to House on the Rock and I heard a word by the spirit that corrected my understanding. Number one, that storms happen to all men and storms are very systems that you are really going to the other side if you did not intend to grow you will not meet with the challenges even Jesus Jesus and his presence in the boat did not stop the manifestation of the storm 
it only stopped the dominion of the storm on the journey. The next thing that I, that I taught you that you need to have at heart is the mind of Christ. There is a mentality that makes men rest in the midst of storms. Can I tell you this? The Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. It says, For thou art with me. That divine presence should be a consolation. Someone declare, say, You are with me. Thou art with me. Thou art with me in the midst of the storm. And then when Jesus woke up, the Bible says, he rebuked the wind and the storm was calm. So the first way we address storms is to rebuke the wind. Next time, go to your shop, go to your mall, go to your business, go to your house. You come back and you see your children bringing reports that are not consistent with the word of God. Just kicking and venting anger on the children will not solve the problem. Always remember, Jesus has taught you what to do with storms. It is not the result. It is not the school. It is not the dull chat. Remember, Satan does not attack for nothing. In that child as CEO. In that child is the employment of 5,000 people. Don't blame the innocent child and bring ill-spoken Ill words over him. You are a failure. You are dull. No! Satan does not attack failures. If you were a Satan, you will not attack failures. That's a waste of time. The Bible says he knows his time is short. So if Satan can handpick people, out of 7 billion people, when he listed people, you were there. You need to verify what parameter he used. And I've already told you, John 10.10, 10, that he only comes when he finds out there is something worth stealing, something worth killing, and something worth destroying. So you can go back and dance in the midst of storms. And they ask you why. You say, number one, the storm has verified that I am valuable. Number two, the storm has verified that in me there are nations. It is better to forget your paddle than to forget Jesus in the boat. Because if it is to calm storms, you don't need skills. You need Jesus. You need skills to move. But there are times that your skills cannot continue the journey. You will need Jesus. There are times that whatever knowledge you have may not be able to continue with you. It is Jesus. And then remember that in your praise and your rest, there is prophecy that you will arrive. Oh, powerful scripture. And they, and they arrived. And they arrived. Even if it's after 10 years, they arrived. Apostle, I've not gotten admission for the past 5-10 years. I bring you a word of hope. While you are talking about admission, prophecy is already saying you are right. Apostle, as I'm speaking right now, there is no place for me to stay. I mean, this church just laughing, but the Lord is waiting for me at home right about now. I may not know what storms you will face, but I can tell you this. If Jesus is in the boat, rejoice. Look up. Let me teach you something. One plus one mathematically is two. Is that true? One plus one demonically is anything less than two. Because Satan does not add. One plus one plus Satan cannot be two. Even if it's not zero, it cannot be two. Because Satan does not add. One plus one plus Jesus is equal to the answer he puts there. The moment you add Jesus to the equation, the answer is no longer scientific. The answer is no longer economic. The answer is, is no longer mathematics. It is the answer he puts there. 
So he can take 10 years of delay plus 2 years of being raised by a single mom plus 15 years of unemployment plus Jesus and he can put one year of victory that is equal to 30 years. Five years of a wayward life plus two years of limited understanding in church plus a job that may not give you so much plus your passion and fire for God then plus Jesus and you will be surprised see what the answer will be. The answer will be the destiny of someone who started working hard from four years. And you say, this is not fair. And he says, Jesus not, does not only add, he can supplement. Anything plus Jesus is the answer he puts there. Let me tell you something. We are wrapping up. There is a very interesting parable I wish I had the time to deal with the scripture. It was a parable about employment. The Bible says a vine owner was drawing people to get into his field. Have you read that, that parable? And he negotiated for a denary with certain people early in the morning. Is that true? So their basis for going to the field was not because they loved the vine owner. It was because they negotiated for a denary. He took them to the field. Later on, he saw some others and said, Why sittest thou idle? They said, No man employ us. And he said, Go. They didn't negotiate. They went because of love and honor to the man. Even at the 11th hour, one hour to the close of work, he still met another. He said, Go. At the end of it, he paid those who came because they wanted payment. Then those who came because they believed him, he said, Now let me decide how to pay you paid them the same amount and they said no there is injustice here and Jesus said what is the injustice I know you came from a lineage of millionaires I know you came from a lineage of those who bless you and maybe that may be your motivation for loving Jesus it was not really because you loved him it was because there was an opportunity you were told that if you stay with him he can bless you Oh dear spiritual employee, you go to the vineyard, your dinner is coming. But then there are others who said, Lord, if you can make any sense out of this life, my, my background has cheated me already. And he said, also come and join. And when it is time for payment, and he's allocating graces and possibilities, he can bring the grace of one, oh dear. I'm saying this prophetically because there are people after this conference. You will stand side by side with those who started being diligent even before you were born again. And they will wonder and say, but this is not fair. And you will tell them, the problem is not me. The problem is the one who carried me along in his boat. Jesus Christ, being in your boat can make the difference. And they arrived. And they arrived. And they arrived. And he met the man at Gadara. Rebuked the spirit out of that man. And the man said, I want to follow you back. He said, no. I came because of you. Now that I'm done with you, I can release you to live out your assignment now. Listen to me. Victory over storms has a purpose to it. The purpose... Is that Jesus be revealed and that Jesus be glorified. When the storms that have attempted to impede your progress are over, let it not be that when you have built houses and cars and everything, you say, my power and the might of my hand has given me this. He says, but thou shalt remember. That means you can forget. I brought a simple message but a powerful one tonight. Because everybody here under the sound of my voice, if there is no storm before you now, I can tell you it is proof that you have not yet made a decision to go to the other side. But if it is the other side of business, the other side of your spiritual life, the other side of your kingdom exploits, the other side in me, then there is a storm 
that is before you. Here is my advice. Check that Jesus is in the boat before the storm comes. The storm will not respect you. It will only respect Jesus who is in that boat. As you carry your certificate, verify whether Jesus is there. As you carry your track record of business exploits, realize that there will come dear Peter where your net may not be able to catch fish. If your net does not catch fish, it is not, it is not laziness. There are times that the fish will not come. You will need Jesus. It is only Jesus who can tell the fish to come. Some of you are in this situation right now. You've exhausted everything you know to do intellectually, spiritually, economically, etc. And you are right now in a confused position, not knowing what to do. Number one, find rest. Storms happen to everybody, even Jesus. Number two, have the mind of Christ. You know that Jesus is in the boat, so find rest, it will not kill you. There is an end. Number three, have the mind of Christ. Superior understanding. Superior understanding that Satan is a master of the sense realm. He will manipulate you into depression. And then you will find out that the challenge, every challenge comes in its inflated form. It takes rest, the rest of faith to deflate it down. Sometimes you will worry over things that are not as serious as they look. And then Jesus taught us how to deal with storms. That you speak over the wind and say in the name of Jesus, this wind making my marriage boisterous, this wind making my academics boisterous, my job, my business, this wind making Nigeria boisterous, this wind making my political career, my ministerial calling boisterous, peace, shalom, be still. And the Bible says the wind and even the water obey him. And then obtain the same power to continue until you arrive. And when you arrive, remember that the arrival has a purpose. Don't drive and begin to celebrate and forget that there is a madman who holds the salvation of ten cities waiting. Could it be that the reason why God wants to prosper you is so that you can meet a child someday, pay that child's school fees, who will be the owner of a bank tomorrow? Annoy 5,000 people. Can I tell you this? Every time you see the madman in Gadara, look beyond not being clothed. Every time you see a madman in Gadara, they will not come to you as great people. They will come to you as people with their fields. They will come to you as people who are outcasts. They will come needing you. It is amazing that on the other side of your success, the first person you meet is the destiny sent to you. You must have the discernment to not allow the beauty of success be cloud you. As a man of God, when God grants you an anointing after the storms, the attacks, and now you come to a position of power and influence, do not forget. For every arrival, there is a madman crying. Businessmen, for every arrival, there is a madman crying. He's holding the destiny of ten cities. Some of you have arrived. And all you are doing at the seashore is a party celebration. And there are madmen crying and saying, is this not why you came? Did he anoint you to just do church? Man of God, now that you have arrived in a measure, what are you doing with that anointing? I am doing ministry. This ministry, I am enjoying myself. Wake up! There is a madman who is waiting for you. There is 
The young man who you need to lead in ministry who will be strengthened and go and save his family and save other generations. Please hear me. We are wrapping up, but you have to get this lesson. For everyone who arrives, and it's a language we like to use in Nigeria, I have... Let me tell you the next assignment. Look for the madman in Ghana. When you arrive, it's proof that you conquered the storm. So we celebrate you for beating the storm hands down. But realize every time you arrive, your next assignment is to locate the madman in Gadara for the sake of the Gadarenes. Rise up on your feet, please. We're going to pray just three prayer points tonight. Prayer point number one will be that God would grant us the strength to have the resilience, to have the stamina and the staying power to continue when the storms of life come. I wish I would tell you storms would not, not come, but I'll be lying to you. If you want to get to the throne, the pathway is across. Oh Joseph, if you want to speak with Pharaoh, be ready to enter the well, go to the prison. I said it in a teaching somewhere that the prison is where both good and bad people meet. Every time you see people in the prison, be careful because Joseph is there too. Not everybody is a criminal. Every time you see men on the cross, be careful Jesus is there too. He is just between two thieves. He may not be a thief. This is already a word for someone. Don't generalize people. You may see Joseph in the prison. But not everybody got there because of a crime of their own. You may see men hanging on various crosses. Don't generalize. Jesus is dead. He's not dying for himself. He's dying for the world. There are thieves that pay the price for their own foolishness. But there are others who are dying for others. You must have the grace to discern. Are you ready to pray? Prayer point number one. Lord, I obtain grace that as I start this journey to the other side, regardless the storms that come, I will arrive. Lift your voice and pray. Please pray. Let it be from the depth of your heart. Shapra gata baka tuska te prende gete bele geta. In the name of Jesus, I declare, I am determined to go to the other side spiritually. I am determined to go to the other side financially. I am determined to go to the other side in destiny. Regardless the storms that I face, I declare that I intend to arrive. Jesus is with me. Are you praying? Obtain grace. Though I walk through the valley low, I'll feel no evil. By the water, still my my heart will trust in You, Lord. My heart will fight. Someone is drawing strength for the journey tonight. So I walk through the valley, I feel no In 
Listen. Please look at me. We are wrapping up. Please lend me your attention everyone. Following and here. Someday you will need to move from being a tenant to a landlord. It is not prophecy. You will have to go to the other side. Someday you would have to take responsibility and raise those children. Everybody has another side to your story. Do not be afraid of making progress to the other side. I can tell you one thing for sure. The other side is not a bed of roses. Faith, they say, does not just make things easy. It makes things possible. The assignment of faith is not to make your journey easy. That is the assignment of favor. The assignment of faith is to make your journey possible. Someday, you have to make up your mind that I'm tired of begging and borrowing. Listen, I have to go to the other side financially. It will take courage. Let us go to the other side. Tell your mind, let us go to the other side. Tell your spiritual life, let us go to the other side. A day will have to come, you look at your wife and say, My dear, he called us to ministry. Thank God for the level we are operating now. But there is need to go to the other side. I can't be the one depending on people to give me money all the time. And I keep praying for others to prosper so they keep me. I can't be the man of God sitting in jealousy and pain and watching God use others. It is time to go to the other side. Listen to me. For someone here, this is a prophetic word. You have encompassed this mountain long enough. Stop celebrating mediocrity as a local champion. It's time to stretch to the other side. Can I tell you this? Don't be so emotionally connected. Yesterday is jealous. Yesterday will never allow you to enter into tomorrow. Yesterday is like a jealous personality. You must obtain the unemotional determination to leave yesterday for the sake of tomorrow. Yesterday will want to recycle itself in your life. From one room, one day the Holy Ghost starts telling you, do you not think you should stroll around Abuja and check? If you can even find three or four plots of land and you want to rebuke it, no, where will I get the money from? All that I have is 100,000. Listen to me. God is speaking to you. For as long as you are unwilling to sustain the courage to go to the other side. For someone you may not have the money, but go and find out where the land is after this conference. Go and stay there and look at it. I cannot buy it, but my eyes have seen it. Can I tell you, one of the ways that you make God Omega is by making him Alpha. He will never become Alpha when he has not become Omega. Start with him and put pressure on his integrity to finish. I should go abroad and educate myself, but where will the help go to? Go online and find out what it takes to start. Just start with Jesus and be sure that you will arrive. You alone will fail, but you and Jesus cannot fail. Are we together? I came here to challenge you tonight. Honestly speaking, there are many of us who have come past this mountain long enough. I don't mean to insult you, but there are people who need to begin to contend for certain levels of grace. You have been in this city for 10 years, 15 years, watching others come to build, watching others come to take risks by faith, and you've been giving all kinds of excuses. It's time to make up your mind. It is better to fail honorably. Listen, there is something called failing forward. When a plane is going forward and someone who is at the front seat goes back to use the restroom, is the man going behind? The plane is moving forward. He's in a plane that overall is going forward. Even though in the plane he's going backward, but the plane is too big for him to move it backwards. That's how your destiny is. Go and start the shop. What do I need? Courage. You don't need products. Open it. Open the shop. Start. Apostle, 
I'm in debt to the millions and the billions. How do I come out? I can tell you, if you think you're going to save your way to go out, you are joking. Listen to me. The first way to come out is to invite Jesus into the situation. You will never come out on your own. When you are in trouble, don't try to come out. Bring Jesus into the situation. There is something about him that cannot let you remain in storms. Are we together? It is time to stretch to the other side. And please do not forget, whenever you arrive, remember, there is a madman in Gadara that all that journey, your financial journey, your intellectual journey, dear worshiper, when you arrive and your songs go to the nation, remember, there is a madman whose deliverance is tied to your songs. Do not allow arrival mentality to destroy you. In this kingdom, we do not stop. We move from level to level to level to level. Now, before I speak over your life to end tonight, I want you to rebuke the storm. We have identified the storm, but Jesus taught us to not forbear with storms. No. When storms finish their assignments, do not let them continue. The assignment of a storm is to verify that you were sent. The assignment of a storm is to convince you that you are moving. When you find that information, the storm does not need to remain again. There are many of us, the storms have stayed beyond their validity period. And Jesus teaches you what to do, that you are about to do now. In the next one minute, please, without distraction, in the name of Jesus as a priest that you are, I'd like you to begin to rebuke every spirit that is back of any situation challenging your life and destiny. Believers pray. The spirit challenging my spiritual growth, challenging my prayer life, challenging my word life, challenging my passion for the house of God, challenging prophecy over my destiny. I come against you now in the name of Jesus Christ. If someone prays, the spirit in the beating church growth, in the beating growth in my business. In the name of Jesus, I repeat you. By the God of heaven, thus far have you come, no further shall you go. The spirit fighting the arrival of the anointing upon my life and destiny. I come against you in the name of Jesus. I come against you by the blood of the Lamb. House on the rock, pray, decree and declare that thou mightest be justified. Every storm stopping my destiny help us from locating me and lifting me by the Spirit. Every storm challenging my business. Every storm challenging Nigeria. Every storm challenging my family. Are you declaring by the Spirit? Please be still. Finances, hear the word of the Lord. Ministry, hear the word of the Lord. Business, hear the word of the Lord. Family life, hear the word of the Lord. Peace be still. I rebuke every spirit. I cast down imagination. Every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ. I declare by the spirit of the living God. Please go ahead and pray. We're wrapping up. Pray. 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 Atmosphere. Sleep now. Pray.
Believers, please hear me. Let me challenge you. I'd like you to use this entire period of this conference as a moment of spiritual emphasis. Some of you need to go home and lock your gate and start walking like the priest that you are around your house. And if they ask you what are you doing, tell them the storm has stayed beyond its limit. The storm has stayed beyond its limit. And you begin to rebuke. Lay your hands upon your documents when you go back home. In the name of Jesus, I end this season of pain. It's time to arrive, not just to move. Declare your arrival, prophesied by the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have prayed, but hear me, the disciples were too weak to rebuke the storm by themselves. But they were also not too proud to tell Jesus, help us. There are certain times you may not have the level of spiritual intelligence, nor the level of engracing to challenge the storms that stand before you. You must be quick to admit it and quickly call Jesus. And can I tell you this? The way Jesus walks is to empower men. Go to them that sell and buy. There are those that sell. This is why he gave in the church apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers for the maturing of the saints. That means everything that makes for the saints to rise to their full prophetic potential is invested in it. Believe me when I tell you there are times you can pray, you can stretch, you can do everything to know to do. Doctors have taught us this. Military people have taught us this. There are times that a doctor can tell you, I am a doctor. There is DR or MD behind or in front of my name. But I admit that this situation is beyond my expertise. Allow the consultants to come. And they do not feel bad allowing the consultants to come. And you can be surprised that a very delicate and complicated surgery, you may see a man who does not have the form, but he's still consultant. I have sent sent carpenters to judge those horns. Carpenters. I have seen a few professionals and consultants and many times they don't have any form. They, they can come and you, you see them, you can almost doubt. You don't know their consultants when they are standing. You know their consultants in the surgery room. And with, with digital precision, they will carry out a very delicate and complicated procedure and come out after a few hours and say it is done. This is how it is in the body of Christ. It is not to worship men, but let me tell you sincerely by God, there are people who by the privilege of the election of grace, they have been vested with certain possibilities. Every time you find out that you've exhausted your creativity around the storm, don't die in pride. Humble yourself. Let your defeat in pride not misrepresent Jesus. He can still come storms if you call him. Hallelujah. I believe that the servants of God here, I'm standing in faith and agreement with them to speak right now. Because there are many of us, you've done, you've prayed, you've fasted, you've done what you know to do. The situation does not seem to listen to you. But he sent us in his name to speak over that situation. And so I want you tonight to shout a loud amen as I speak and declare just one minute and we're done. I just want to speak over your life. Prophecy is powerful. It says they are taken for a prey and none see it restore. In the name of Jesus, I, I stand joining faith with the Father and the priest over this commission and the angel over this house and the servants of God here we connect our spirits 
and in the name that is above all names right now i decree and i declare everyone here whose journey has been impeded by a storm i speak to that storm this night not tomorrow this night come to an end now 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 every force that is stopping your advancement or that of your children maybe financially ministerially in the name of jesus christ the son of the living god i speak to that spirit and i speak to that storm release god's people now and i decree and declare over your life listen to me immediately the storm was calm time was no longer a factor the bible just said they arrived how long it took after the storm i told you when jesus comes in the calculation changes for some of you god told you certain things in january and as it is now it is october and you are saying by the logic of men when can i build this business i tell you when jesus is introduced you'll be surprised let me speak to you by the spirit of grace in a matter of weeks for some of you may the prophecy that you had right from january come to pass hear me for some of you as you go home right now your prophecy will run faster than you and wait for you at home as a testimony in the name of jesus christ there are many of you by the time you are coming here tomorrow morning i decree and declare over your life it will be tears of joy you will be coming here with. can i tell you this i would not do this except god put it in my heart i want to declare over your finances this night by the spirit i'm just responding to what god is putting in my heart you will marvel and wonder i am telling you this by the god of heaven do not be like the man in samaria who said even if god will open the windows of heaven listen there is a prophetic dimension to wealth in this kingdom we are not just business people there is a government above us in the name of jesus christ i stretch my hands over everyone here especially those who have gone through all kinds of financial turmoils i stand by the god of heaven between now and tomorrow that your faith can receive it i declare return with strange testimonies return with strange testimonies supernatural connection to destiny help us in the name of jesus christ tonight as you go to bed may the heavens be opened over you supernatural ideas instructions strategies that are required for the next level of your life receive them by prophecy in the name of jesus christ wave your hands to jesus and give him praise hallelujah i believe in jesus i believe in the power of his word i believe in transformation i believe that territories can come under the influence of the government of heaven i also believe in miracles i believe god can change lives and tonight as we begin a series of teachings i want to encourage you in addition to the marvelous work that has been done by the way let's give honor to all the vessels that god has used before this time fully honor you sirs hallelujah amen the bible declares that he has not called the seed of jacob to seek him in vain i 
I have been so honored and touched just knowing the sacrifices that many of you have made. Many of you have traveled from far, traveled from near. I can tell you one thing about God. There is a name that he is called, a rewarder. A rewarder. He rewards. He rewards. Hallelujah. And so may I encourage you before you sit to number one, please pay attention to the teachings because the power of God is derived from his word. Anointing has no ministry. The assignment of the anointing is to insist that the word of God becomes true in your life. And so if there is no declaration of that which has been spoken, the anointing has no ministry. God only does what he says. He does not just do what you want. He does not just do what is needed. The only way you can get God to do a thing is also to make him say it. Genesis 21 verse 1. Please keep standing. Please keep standing. Genesis, will we have it projected? Please read with me if you are a Christian when you have it projected. Genesis chapter 21 and verse 1. Please just help those under the anointing. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. The only reason why he visited her was not because she was in need. It was because he said it. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. The only way God performs is when he says. Hallelujah. And I want you to also be very sensitive because you see graces have their effects when they are allowed to find expression and, and i don't mean to sound arrogant sincerely forgive me if i do but i can tell you one thing for sure that whilst you are seated listening it is not only the sound of the word you will be hearing you will also be hearing sounds of the abundance of rain <laughs> hallelujah praise the name of the lord now, I don't know why the Holy Spirit is moving me this way, but I'm seeing the number seven before we sit. Listen, the number seven. Please help them. The power of God is coming on them right now as I speak. Seven. For you will never be the same when the presence of Jesus. Just be patient, we'll sit down. This is why you came. You came for a conference. What is that mountain that stands before you? name of Jesus for there is a name that has been exalted above every other name and in the name of Jesus who is the son of the living God I decree and declare that everything that does not name the name of Christ it bows to the Lordship of Jesus tonight <laughs> hallelujah we are going to sit down But I'm hearing in my spirit restoration. This is. There are people who have lost things through 
the pandemic some of you came here are taken for a prey and none say yet restore it takes a voice to declare restoration hallelujah and i'm seeing the number 21 we may not be able to bring people out here but i stretch my hands the power of god is coming i'm seeing the number 21 you will be amazed at what happens to you tonight may the grace that brings that which has left you may that grace come upon you now take that grace help them please take that grace in the name of jesus the son of the living god let the help now please restoration of everything that has been lost i speak to a man of god here it looks like the mantle and the grace of god upon your life you are seeing things go down in life and in ministry i lend my voice with the man of god and i speak to you there hallelujah please sit down if you can we have to walk with time in every spirit that is not of the christ in this place to liberty right now in jesus name you see the bible says wherefore God had so highly exalted him. South Africa, hear me. Jesus is alive. And for many of you, Jesus is still alive. Amen. Did we greet? Good evening, everyone. So let's get to the word. Again, it's my joy to be here. I, I believe that the Lord sent me here. Thank God for the blessings of relationship. And um, this is not a meeting just for House of Treasures. This is an apostolic and a prophetic conference that is for South Africa, is for Africa, for the nations of the earth. Hallelujah. What we're discussing the topic i would like to just brief us if you will just to help us understand how god is going to be leading us through our discourse um, my assignment is to challenge the body of christ across this territory and to help them to lend my voice and in faith with all the servants of god within this territory so that we are able to experience greater levels of the move of God even within this territory in the name of Jesus and so tonight we will be examining the current state of the church the body of Christ it's, it's a spiritual x-ray we are going to be looking at the body of Christ from a standpoint of love and a passion to, to see how we can rise to higher spiritual dimensions if you're with me say amen and then we will also be examining in subsequent sessions i will be teaching are we together jesus said in acts chapter 1 and verse 8 he says you shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you and he says you will be witnesses unto me and he gives you geography your witness has geography our witness is not random he tells us we are witnesses and he begins to list the geographic component of our witness ultimately to the ends of the earth but to jerusalem samaria judea to the uttermost part of the earth and i hope that you will have the time to discuss a bit on the work of the ministry this is particularly for men and women of god those who are called into ministry that god will grant us grace to sharpen one another here and there just put dots on the eyes and cross the t's and to help bring ourselves to higher levels of accuracy and precision as far as the work of the kingdom is concerned and of course 
in a meeting like this God will never leave himself without a witness therefore expect outpourings of the spirit marvelous healings and miracles like he has begun expect such a move of the spirit in this conference if you believe everything we're going to be doing please talk to the Lord in one minute my heart is open send your word send your word send your word hallelujah amen for tonight can these bones leave that's my teaching for tonight ezekiel 37 please can these bones leave we're examining the mystery behind degeneration the mystery behind decadence and the mystery behind the restoration what does it take for a man to go down and what does it take for a man to be restored the Bible says the things that are written aforetime that they are for our learning so that we through the comfort of Scripture might find hope that means that scattered in this Bible are the truths the principles of the kingdom that help us to learn God help us to know God we understand his character we understand his ways when we examine scripture are we together so Ezekiel chapter 37 this was an encounter that prophet Ezekiel had this is um, a prophetic picture if you would want to look at it that it was it was a picture of the current state of the nation of Israel that is also applicable remember we are doing a spiritual anatomy we want to examine the body of Christ as it is now what is worth commenting what is worth addressing because until we can look at ourselves in light of what God intends to do we might not be able to find our way out when you find a man who is lost and he's trying to look for the direction the first thing you ask him is where are you he has to be able to identify where he or she is then you can direct them from that point you're on your way to house of treasures and now you've missed your way we cannot help you until we find a way of making you aware of where you are is that true so Ezekiel 37 let's hurry up for time and the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and he caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said unto me son of man can these bones leave and the prophet said i am used to seeing things change in the realm of the spirit but this is a difficult situation and even as a prophet i confess only thou knowest so now the bible begins by describing a state every bone here was once a human based on that vision the question is not what happened later on forget about that we're coming there the real question is what happened that the humans now deteriorated to the point where they became bones because if you do not understand why this degeneration happened any miracle will only be a waste you have to first correct what happened that necessitated that miracle are we learning now so he is taken to a valley that is full of dry bones and bones in scripture among other things talk of structure structure when joseph left a prophecy he said make sure my bones are taken when you are leaving egypt 
take my bones with you he did not just mean the physical bones take the spiritual structure that gave you favor in a harsh land don't lose it there is a formula that i gave you that made you to prevail even in egypt when you are living take that structure with you the structure of the presence of god the structure of reverence for the things of god so the first thing that we see here that god was addressing was not life it was the bones let's do something about the bones the army is a product of the bones until the bones came together there was no need for life there was no need for flesh are we together now the truth is that the bible is full of instances where god would send warnings to his people attempting to call them back to their first love attempting to plant in them their long lost passion all through scripture especially when we read through the life of the nation of israel they were god's covenant people they were his beloved people but once and again you would find out that for some reason there would be a way a system of spiritual halotry they would deviate from the known patterns of god and when that happened usually from scripture they are handed over to their enemies is that true and then when that happens god would send a prophet and he would call them and most times they would heed to his warning and he would bring them salvation and bring them restoration so the idea of deviating from the patterns of god the idea of deviating from god's authorized system his modus operandi is not something that is new it's happened from scripture it's happened through scripture through, through history that a people can be on fire today and for some reason lose it our history is full of revivals the moves of god you would read i believe that south africa has its share of that history men and women of god who arose from your soil doing mighty things for god many of them have gone to be with the lord when you read through bible when you read through history across africa europe us you would find out that at a particular time in history there seem to have been certain men and women who came from maybe backgrounds that were not really something to write home about but god used them to do marvelous things some finished well some did not finish well both are lessons for us are we together today we live in very troubling times in africa and across the globe the church is going through a very prophetic season of transition there is a lot that is going and, and every nation um, without exception has had its share of issues as far as the body of christ is concerned i believe it's been the same thing in this region too that there's been all kinds of shifts all kinds of things and this is very important jesus himself built his church and he had so many things to say about the church two things jesus said about the church that is very instructive number one in matthew chapter 5 we begin our reading from verse 13 jesus himself is teaching in what we know theologically to be the beatitudes matthew chapter 5 we we'll begin our reading from verse 13 jesus is teaching now and he tells them you are the salt of the earth everybody says salt of the earth salt of the earth means that you give you add value and you preserve that's the assignment of salt it adds taste and it preserves that means the decadence in the world is a report card that the church might be failing somewhere because the bible tells us that we are salt is that true you are the salt of the earth but it says if the salt has lost its savour, wherein shall it be salted it is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men next verse we're reading to 16 verse 14 please it says ye are the light of the world that means the definition of darkness is not when power is out it is the world without the church 
God's definition of darkness is not the absence of electricity. It's the world without the church. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. And then it says, neither do men light a lamp. The next verse a candle and put it under a bushel but upon a candlestick and it giveth light to all who are in the house and then he says let your light so shine the word let is the word permit permit your light to so shine not in heaven before men he wants them to see your good works and so glorify your father in heaven so jesus tells us as a church please pay attention that we are light he says we are salt when you read matthew chapter 16 maybe just write it for reference matthew 16 from verse 13 down to 19 matthew 16 13 down to 19 jesus began a discussion about his identity that would be where he would talk eventually about the concept of church look at how the idea of church started it started with an identity crisis the people did not know him and he says who do men say that i the son of man am it was a very good question because he he wondered at the confusion the people who were close to him they said well we do not know some say you are john the baptist you are elijah incarnate you are one of the prophets jeremiah and he said okay who do you say that i the son of man is or am and he was surprised that none of them even though they were close to him they really did not know who he was so proximity does not mean revelation just because you are close to scripture just because you are carrying a bible just because you are around christian activities does not necessarily mean you have an encounter peter alone spoke by the spirit he said i know who thou art thou art christ the son of the living god and then he says this he says flesh and blood has not revealed this to you then he says thou art peter and upon this rock what rock upon this understanding i will construct my church based on this understanding that nothing will be able to work in your life until you first have a revelation of it this is the formula that i will build my church upon that means you don't just tell people be free until you have a revelation of the grace supports the revelation so he says i will build my church this way and if you allow my church to function this way it will be so formidable the gates of hell shall not prevail against it so if the gates of hell seem to be prevailing effortlessly over the church we must go back and examine our spiritual architecture there is something we have lost now re re remember that a conference like this is not about pointing fingers a conference like this is about a corporate examination are we together now i have to say that it is true that the state of any territory is largely a reflection of the kind and the quality of believers within that territory please take note the state of any territory any nation any region is largely a reflection of the kind and the quality of believers within that territory this is very true every time a nation was in decadence every time a territory was in decadence god's first port of call was the believers or his covenant people god addressed the nation by addressing the church you have to pay attention to this this is very important every time a territory or a nation begins to plunge through some sort of decadence when god comes to solve the problem truly speaking he does not go to government he does not go to royalties he comes straight to the church and says what is going on church i kept you here and mandated you with an assignment are we together now This is very important. All across Africa, like I said, and all across Europe, the US, we know that 
things are happening economically, things are happening politically like we've never seen before. And I can tell you this, the church has a role to play. The church needs to give the world an explanation as to why we have allowed darkness to move as though the reality of the finished work of Jesus were a lie. Are we together now? So, Ezekiel is caught up in the spirit and he's shown a vision. And it's a vision of a once great army that had now become bones. And the interesting thing is that the bones were so disjointed. You would look at the valley and almost not see the bones, but all of them were there. What scattered them so much? Because under a certain condition, those bones can come again. So every bone that was scattered was still there. Out of sight, but not beyond reach. There was a condition that was initiated. And the Bible says the bones began to come again. And at the end of it, here was an exceeding great army standing. For tonight, I want to... I want us to walk together as the body of Christ over South Africa and over Africa generally and then across the world. Let's walk together as I identify three major factors. Please write this down. Three major factors that I believe have affected the quality of believers. The quality of the spiritual products that have come out of our churches out of our assemblies, out of our spiritual platforms. And remember, I teach as one who is a son of the soil. I am an African myself. And so I teach from a standpoint of love. I teach as one who is a co-laborer. Are we together now? I have only come to strengthen the hand of the body of Christ that together we rise to the next level that God has destined for us. But we must pay attention and we must be honest. Listen to me. What you are about to learn tonight for many of you is a confirmation of what the Spirit has been showing you. For many of you it may be a correction of your approach to life and ministry and even spirituality. But for all of us together there are things to learn so that our children and our children's children will be able to preserve the power, the grace and the potency of the name of the Lord. Are we still together? So let's continue. Three factors that have affected our territories haven't agreed that the quality the quality of the believers within a territory defines in large proportion the quality of that territory economically speaking politically speaking etc number one what is the first problem what is the first issue? What is the first factor that has affected the quality of believers in today's church? Number one, the first real factor is that most believers or most people, most church people, if I would use that expression, they have no genuine encounter with God. Now, I, I, this, this, I, I, let me apologize in advance. Don't feel bad when these things, you just accept it as God trying to help you. Because those he loves, he chastises. Are we together now? The absence of genuine encounter with God from the pulpit to the pew is a major problem. For as long as we do not have a genuine encounter with God, the products that come out of that aberrated Christian experience cannot be potent enough to host God within a territory. Please pay attention. The plane is only preparing to lift. No genuine encounters with God. You see, the spiritual protocol, look up please. The spiritual protocol is every time God calls you, He does not send you. Your first assignment is not to go and work for Him. Every time He calls you, the formula is follow me. I am your object, not ministry, not business, not church. When God calls you, He says follow me. 
when he makes you then he sends you just because you are called does not mean you are sent listen now pay attention come follow me follow me your calling is not to a pulpit your calling is not to a marketplace believe me your calling is not to politics your calling is to jesus what you call pulpit marketplace politics is just the geography of your witness after you have effectively fulfilled your calling the absence of a genuine encounter with jesus is what has produced the plethora of issues that we have first from the pulpit and then across membership and then by extension to society when god called moses when you read exodus chapter 3 exodus 33 you read all these scriptures they tell you that when moses he saw a bush that was burning and would not be consumed guess what he says i will turn aside and see this great sight when god saw that he had turned aside he said moses take off your shoes from where you stand this holy ground and a discourse began and at the end of it god said now you are crying for a revelation of me i am that i am know me first before you go and stand before pharaoh because pharaoh will ask you who sent you are we blessed listen to me it is important that we have genuine encounters with god isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13 let's hurry up for time isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13 repeated also in matthew chapter 15 and verse 8 isaiah 29 and 13 any of them please just give it to us media so that we can make progress it says wherefore the lord said for as much as these people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips to do honor me but have removed their hearts far from me and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men in other words they draw near with their mouth but in in reality their hearts are far from me in acts chapter 4 and verse 12 oh once again dear south africa africa and the globe let's reintroduce jesus that the foundation of the believer's experience is not miracles it's not signs it's not wonders it's not the prophetic it's not the apostolic it's not even revelation the foundation is jesus hear me the formula for any life that must excel is that in the beginning god if it becomes in the beginning fame in the beginning ministry in the beginning a desire for signs and wonders you have corrupted the formula god cannot be omega until he's allowed to be alpha don't allow something else to be alpha and then ask him to come and finish what you started he only finishes what he started he is only omega over what he was alpha over please pay attention genuine encounters with god can i tell you this there is a way that when you encounter god you will love him more than preaching you will love him more than business you will love him more than politics genuine encounter with god one of the pillars that can allow men host god at a territorial level genuine encounter many believers today i tell you sincerely many people in church cannot exactly tell if they are saved or not when we started with god in fact we were made to write dates when we gave our lives to christ i don't know is there someone here who remembers you can't arbitrarily hope you are saved wish you were saved imagine that you are saved if you are saved you are saved if you are not saved 
and there is a spiritual formula we are not left to guess whether you are saved no there is a formula the bible says in acts chapter 4 please give us acts chapter 4 and verse 12 neither is there salvation in any other body of christ let's look at this and remind ourselves for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved you cannot say you are saved when you have not encountered jesus it's not jesus and a group of delegates that save you no when it has to do with salvation there are no delegates it is jesus or jesus alone if you have met and routed to any other person that you gave your life to according to the authority of scripture you are not saved romans chapter 10 from verse 8 to 10 the absence of a genuine encounter with jesus is one of the first reasons why we have this level of decadence that is in the similitude of Ezekiel's vision. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. Verse 9. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Can I be honest with you? It is not everything you believe about Jesus that equals salvation. There are specific things you have to believe about Jesus to be saved. Believing Jesus is a good man does not save you. Believing Jesus is the founder of an honorable religion does not save you. There are specific details about Jesus. You must believe in him crucified. You must believe he died. You must believe he rose again for our justification. You must believe today he is seated at the right hand of the Father. If you do not believe this, you are not a Christian. It's as honest and sincere as that. We may differ, denominationally speaking, across different schools of thought. We may differ um, across several things, I understand. But it is in this one thing that we cannot allow ourselves to differ. Because if we lose the revelation of this, there is no Christianity again. Here and there we may argue, we may disagree with one another across certain doctrinal issues. That's alright. But on this one thing, anyone who names the name of Christ must agree that this is the formula for salvation. If thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lordship of Jesus and then believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible declares thou shalt be saved. Even if you fall down under the anointing and stand up and you don't confess this, you are not saved. You had a powerful service, but you are not saved. Can I be sincere with you? It's important we have to be sure of the admission process again. How there are all kinds of inventions as to this Jesus thing. And while we are a people of love, it is important that we preserve the destiny of a generation by reminding us again that everything starts with Jesus. More than preacher, more than Apostle Joshua Selman. Jesus, Jesus. Listen, keep quiet and listen carefully. Jesus. Jesus be the center of your church. Jesus be the center of your church From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus Oh, Jesus So from my heart to the heavens Jesus be the center it's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. Listen to me. 
the more you know God, I tell you the truth, the more you will not even want to be the one seen. The formula is that I may decrease so that you will increase. The obsession to be known is proof we have not encountered the God of the Bible. Believe me when I tell you this. Listen, many of you here are medical doctors. There is a way you look at a patient and certain attributes in that patient show the deficiency of certain vitamins. You can look at the patient and know immediately with pin drop accuracy that this patient lacks vitamin C. There is a way an individual can behave. You can know immediately that there are things that are not in place. An obsession to be known. It doesn't matter who is pushed away. No. When you know Jesus and you love him, it is an honor to represent him. Whether in ministry, whether in business. Can I be honest with you? The dominion that we have in this kingdom is not absolute dominion. We, our dominion is shared dominion. You want to understand how shared dominion works? Look at the moon and the sun. The moon does not have any light of its own, but it still glows. It glows to the degree to which it aligns to the sun. None of us have any power of our own, grace of our own. Everything we have is derived from what we have received. And let me tell you this. Everybody, and I encourage preachers, we must be unashamed to let the world know how helpless we are without Him. It is good that people honor us. It is good that people bless us. But please, for God's sake, let them know that Jesus is the one who is Lord. To see you high and lifted up you are shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love We sing holy, holy, holy Listen, I can tell you this Until we get to a point where our encounter with God Produces genuine brokenness 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 that brings you to a point where your obsession is to see Jesus revealed and see Jesus glorified. That is it. That becomes the anthem, the motto for your life. Why are you in business more than just making money? To see Jesus revealed, to see Jesus glorified. Why are you in ministry, dear man of God, more than wanting to show that God called me? That is an inferior reason to be in ministry. And I was taken to a valley that once had a great army. What happened? Could it be that if the army kept focus on the one who gave them life, they would not deteriorate to become bones? The first thing we see from these bones is there must have been rebellion from the life source. If the voice could bring them back, then it meant that voice was what would keep them alive. They lost touch with the voice. That's why they became bones. Oh, may I never get to a point where I make people believe that outside of God, by my will, I can bless and lift people. Joshua Selman does not have that power. Everything you see is derived from our relationship with God. Let's return back to the foundational truths. Otherwise, we are going to destroy our children and our children's children. They will not even know what they are called into. Please sit down. Can these bones live again? The answer is yes. If they pay attention to the voice that once gave them life. Can I be honest with you? There is a difference between pride, pride and confidence. Your confidence is acknowledging that which God has graciously made you become through Christ. And the Bible says, don't cast it away because it has a great recompense of reward. 
but there is pride you know what pride is pride is coming to a point where you become vocal through your life and through your voice that there is no government above you the moment you get to that point the devil does not need to attack you you are finished the very justice system of God is what will judge you are we learning something tonight please hear me many of us younger people in ministry let me encourage you sincerely never fight the body but be careful who you listen to many of us have listened to and, and it doesn't have to be bad people no I can be a sincere person loving you with all my heart but if I ask you to enter a car and I cannot drive you and all your children and your wife and your entire family sincerity may not take you to your destination the absence of genuine encounters do you know when God called me, and I'm sure that Apostle Felix will tell you, and many other people, when God, when I started my work with God, SARS, it was never about ministry. I never even knew. Most of the people God is marvelously using today, ask them how many times they ran away from the call of God. They didn't want all that trouble. They said, Lord, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I just want to love you and to serve you. And God said, I have called you. But right now, Please look at me. Look at me. I'm preaching to Africa. We need to return back to our passion. Ministry can become idolatry if God is out of it. Business can become idolatry if God is out of it. Genuine encounters with God. Gone are the days where people will lock themselves for one week. And just say, Lord, I want to know you. I'm not looking for power for a conference. It is you I'm looking for. No. We didn't study our Bibles just because we're looking for sermons. No. No. We truly, genuinely, desperately wanted him. Let's go back and re-examine ourselves. He told Cain and Abel, said, if you have done it right, will I not accept it? Society today is sadly a reflection of the carelessness and the nonchalance of the church. While we slept, Satan came in and planted all kinds of things. The question again is can these bones live? You have heard it in my teachings. You celebrated me so graciously when I came. Thank God for your apostle, the man of God and his dear wife. Thank God for all the servants of God. But I want you to look at me. Behind this man you see, there is absolutely nothing out of the mercy of God. Listen, this is not an expression of weakness. When you make statements like this, you are very powerful. It was weakness that kills strength. When you see strength, beware. Strength is not very strong. Weakness is what kills strength on the cross. When the anointing of the Spirit comes upon you and finds strength, it goes back. It must find you incapacitated in yourself that God becomes your completion. Listen to me. Let our altars and our pulpits once again become platforms for salvation. Let our messages once again, among the many things that we teach, do not teach as if sinners are no longer coming. It is good to mature and build people. But while you teach the different dimensions of the kingdom, still go back and remember, one sinner came to church today. Who needs to encounter Jesus? And if that sinner does not encounter Jesus, that will be the entrance point of evil in that church. They are the ones who tomorrow will be appointed positions because of longevity in the church without encounter. Please pay attention. 
genuine encounter with the Lord. Number two, let me rush for sake of time. So three factors we're examining tonight that have been responsible for the current state of the church and by extension the nation as seen prophetically in the vision of Ezekiel. Number one, the absence of genuine encounter with the Lord. Number two, very quickly. Ready for number two? Very low level of discipleship. Oh, this is a concept you do not hear again in the body of Christ. Younger believers don't even know what this is. What is discipleship? Discipleship is the methodical approach. A scriptural and methodical approach to growth and maturity as far as spiritual things are concerned. The name, the doctrinal name given to the pathway that leads an individual who comes into Christ to now grow and have stature and maturity is discipleship. Discipleship is not a religious thing. People have made religion out of it, I understand. But intrinsically, discipleship is the methodical approach. Please look up. Did you know that the growth and the maturity of the saints was not supposed to be guesswork? Um, do we have any medical doctor here? Please stand, sir. Do we have any other medical doctor here? Any at all? Thank you. Did you by any means go to the same college of medicine with that lady? You're not sure. Now, how come both of you or all of you can accurately do the same thing, even though you've never met yourselves, because of the formula that was used to train you? You didn't have to know yourselves. That means the manual is greater than the lecturers that taught you. So, although you were from one region, and you were from one region, but both of you are called doctors, and you can actually meet for the first time in a surgery room, and not doubt yourselves because of the dexterity of the manual that was used to train you. Now, please sit down. Sit down. Sit down. How come... When I call a man Christian A, stand up. Christian B, stand up. Christian C, stand up. And all three come to sit down. You cannot even understand what they are discussing. So what is wrong? There must be, we have to probe into the manual that has been used for that training. Or we have to probe into the sincerity of the lecturer. Please sit down. Please pay attention. There is, listen, there is a cause content that is given for the maturity of the believers. And it is not an invention of any preacher. The cause content that has already been predefined to make any believer become mature. The name of that cause content is doctrine. Doctrine is the cause content allocated for the building and the maturity of the saints. Doctrine comes from the Latin word doctrina. It means a, a, a predefined body of knowledge that helps the student become something exact. Doctrina, a body of knowledge. Now, respectfully speaking, what happens... Now, remember, we agreed that all our teaching is not to point fingers. If you are pointing fingers at anybody, you are not part of us in this conference now. You have to understand. There is no tell them. We are all a family of faith. Very matured, very intelligent people who are as one body helping to solve what is wrong with that body. Please sit down. Are you learning? See, let me teach you something. The zenith of transformation is not enlightenment, it is love. We know you are most transformed, not through the communication of knowledge alone. If your knowledge grows as your love depletes, it is not the Holy Spirit who is responsible for that building. Because if God builds you, the more you know, the more your love life rises to match your revelation. So that you dispense the truths that you know from a standpoint of love. The love factor is what validates that God taught you. Be learning all these things. This is a conference. 
discipleship. Second Timothy chapter 3. My goodness. Wherever we stop tonight, we'll share the grace and come tomorrow. This is a school of the spirit. Second Timothy chapter 3 from verse 15. Very quickly if we can. Second Timothy. And that from a child. Everybody say child. So you are supposed to begin to learn the ways of God from a child. If you become an adult before you start, time is already against you. You have to create extra lessons to quickly because what you need to learn, you need to learn it on time. And that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture. Are we together? Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. To 17 now. All scripture, he's still talking to that child, is given by God. By inspiration of God and is profitable for, please talk to me, for first doctrine before reproof. There cannot be reproof and correction when there is no basis. The basis is doctrine. Then from the lens of doctrine, we can now adjust the excesses. The excesses, correcting, the, this is why, let me balance this. Oh dear. We have other sessions. Let me not. Please pray for me. That we just. Do you know. Maybe this may be a word from God. To just help someone tonight. Not everybody. Has the grace to correct the body of Christ. Just because you see things going wrong. Does not mean you just stand up and start talking. Correcting the body of Christ is an office. Listen, this is South Africa. Do you just go as a citizen and arrest anybody for doing wrong? There is an authorized system. Is that true? Licensed. And when they come, the first thing they show you is their license. Do you know what your license is? There is a requisite level of love you must have for the body. If not, you would never be given the grace to correct that body. You cannot correct the body from a standpoint of antagonism, from a standpoint of bitterness. Your motive is already corrupted yourself. Hmm. Everybody say discipleship. Please shout it. Say discipleship. Do you know why the educational systems in most of our top universities globally work? Harvard, Yale, Oxford. Do you know why? Because they insist on maintaining standards of what is being taught. They have all kinds of quality control systems that they will not bend to. So you can trust the products that come out from there. The primary reason why the educational systems, respectfully speaking, in Africa continue to plunge is because there is no insistence on, there is no standardization. So all kinds of compromises can come. That is how it is spiritually. Can I be honest with you? When you understand doctrine, you see, the thing about spiritual growth and knowledge is that believers do, do not just learn anything spiritual to grow. There is a sequence when a believer comes to Christ and gets born again, the next thing to teach that believer, doctrinally speaking, is not success. If you teach that person success from that standpoint, you have only given the flesh what to manifest. That person will most likely not last. That person needs to understand the rudiments of godliness, repentance from dead works, the power of character. Now, when you teach that person, by the time you come into the series on success, there is already a background. He knows you have tamed the flesh. So, the teaching on success now comes to a mature believer who understands the purpose of influence, the purpose of wealth. We cannot randomly teach anything just because we find it from scripture. Look at me please. Again, let me use an example with our educational system. Assume with me for instance that you find a student in the university, in college. Today you run to the faculty of engineering for lecture. Tomorrow you run to the faculty of medicine or the college of medicine. Next tomorrow you go to art. Are you in the university? Yes. Will you graduate? Because your knowledge is not methodical. 
you are in the system but you are not growing when they award you a certificate or a degree, it's because you have stayed in keeping with the, the sequence of the growth across a field of study. They don't give you degree for everything. They give you degree for the field that you chose to stay on course for. Listen to me. Apostle Felix, if an average believer is called right now at random, let's call an average believer who has been in church for say two years, three years, five years and you stand here and we interview you based on the foundational doctrines of scripture you will be surprised and even weep that the average believer does not even have an under what do you know about prayer? what do you know about salvation? can I get someone saved and hand him over to you and say I will return back in two years I should meet a general I should meet a champion do you know how to what is the next course? Are we blessed? That's why after this conference, you should come to meet your man of God and hug him and say, thank you, sir. Thank you for giving an opportunity for the body of Christ, not only in South Africa, but across. Can I be honest with you? Every national problem was first a regional problem. Every regional problem was first a community problem. Every community problem was first a family problem. Every family problem was first a problem that was not solved by the church, which is the light. Nothing starts at a national level. Everything only manifests at a national level. It is very easy to change a territory. You change a nation by changing regions, by changing communities, by changing families by working on the church Africa is about the most religious continent across the globe am I right on that and can I be honest with you the average church in Africa attends has at least contact with a spiritual leader once or twice every week If what we are producing is not bringing glory to the name of the Lord, there must be an unashamed examination. Let's examine the course content. Let's examine the state of the lecturer. First, there are other issues, but they are not as powerful as we make them. Satan knows this. And he will do anything to keep us arguing and fighting one another. Addressing the issues that are the obvious but not the right ones. Doctrine. I've had the honor of praying for many institutions and many businesses and many companies. And for some of them, I see the dexterity around their administrative system. When I came in here, the excellence of your protocol, I saw all of the people, uh, uh, the wonderful, your, your, your whole reception team here. Do you know why these people are like that? They are trained. They didn't guess their way on what to do. Now, watch this. Everybody, please watch this. Please look up if you can find it. Who asked him to come? Who asked him to come and pick it? Why didn't you come? Do you not love your pastor? Why didn't you come? It's not your jurisdiction. You were trained. Are you seeing this now? Anytime there is no training, there will be disorder. I just threw this arbitrarily. And he knows I put pressure on his office and his training. Now his ability to do this has proven that this man is a good shepherd. Let's sit down. I was glad, thank you, when they said unto me, you see why it's really, this should be the basis of your confidence when you invite people to church. You invite them with this passion, knowing that just one service. You see that now? And you tell them, please come to the house of God. You will find wisdom there. Listen, the church should not be or look like a nuisance to civilization. No. 
the contents that we give are profitable always. It's not just the spiritual lives of the people. We communicate ideas that transform people and eventually help people to build the nation. The church is not just some spiritual nuisance. No, we are a blessing to everybody. We are the principal shapers of the spiritual convictions of any territory. So there is a serious discipleship problem. We must examine the things that we teach. Hebrews chapter 6 talks to us about the doctrinal pillars of the Christian faith. Doctrinal pillars. Six of them it lists. And then it says let us go on into perfection. Not laying again the foundation of doctrine of baptisms laying on of hands resurrection eternal judgment etc hallelujah we must be methodically built number three let me hurry up for time what is the third factor that is responsible for the decadence of the church like prophetically seen in the vision of ezekiel are you ready for this number three is that there are few models or references few models in certain territories there are almost no models few models or references that can inspire people and show people pragmatically how to be a christian can i tell you this every territory strives to the degree to which they find models that reflect their aspirations business people excel because there are individuals who are seen as models when a territory does not have models men and women who have paid the price to become worthy references that you can draw from their lives the inspiration to continue you can literally use their lives as a marking script to correct yourself as you move. The Bible says, Woe to a city whose king is a child. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12. The absence of worthy references and models. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them. Followers of them. So you follow he. The American use the image of an individual to help you and say it is possible. Keep moving. Don't bend. That a man can prosper with the dignity of kingdom integrity and still move forward. When your life is, when you are prayerless, the Holy Ghost can use the face of someone. Question, how many models are in Africa? That can be used. But because there was no one who had done it. There was no model to create inspiration. Many people believed. And someone did it. And someone did it. Now you go and check the records. How many people have climbed? Many, many business people. Usually when you find a territory that has one businessman that rises. Becomes a global voice. Now he can become a reference. They can follow his footsteps. Can I tell you this? Until we find solid Christians in South Africa, in Africa, Christians indeed. There will be a very major problem. And if you have only one or two or three people, that reference is too small. You need many people. There is a reason why Jesus came and gathered 12 people. Gathered 72. Gathered 120. He said, I am making you witnesses. Who is a witness? A witness is a validator of a claim. You do not need a witness until there is a contention over that claim. It's amazing. That in Ezekiel 37, as I attempt to round up for tonight, when God said, can these bones live? The prophet said, only thou knowest. And he said, prophet, if I speak alone, even though the bones are hearing me, 
they will not come. I need you. Repeat what I have said. I am God, but I designed the system that as far as it has to do with the earth, there must be a man who will echo what I'm saying. And he said unto me, the Bible did not say, and he said, he said unto someone, this is what I desire, but I need you to make it happen. Prophesy. So this is one of the strategies for the restoration of decadence. The power of words and the power of information. The Bible tells us that in this kingdom, men live through food and words. Food and words. Prophesy to these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, don't lie about it. If they are dry, tell them they are dry. You will come back to life, but first admit you are dry bones. And then he says, O ye dry bones, I have diagnosed your condition, but there is hope. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, can I tell you this? In the midst of all the things that are happening in the body of Christ, in the midst of all that we see across Africa and society, let me bring you a word of comfort. Do not make a mistake of believing that the church is dead or finished. No. I can tell you there is a formula, there is a strategy that can bring that dead church back to life. South Africa, hear me. The church in this nation and the church across Africa is in a very defining moment. There are all kinds of shifts happening. But find rest. Jesus is still the best brother indeed. Because we would have laid aside all of these attributes of the flesh. And God would have walked and built us. You ask about the next move of God. He's asking you, can these bones leave? Can these bones leave? Please hear me. In the book of Jonah chapter 1, the first two or three verses talk about God giving Jonah an instruction to go to Nineveh. Jonah was so hot and angry, he ran away until he entered into the belly of the fish. Are we together? When he came out in repentance and brokenness, Chapter 3 from verse 1. The word of the Lord came to him again. Please give us Jonah 3 and verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Africa. That great city. God still calls a place that needs repentance a great city. Oh, come on. Someone did not see a prophetic word there. Africa, I know we have gone through a lot. Yes, sir. Politically, economically, spiritually. I know you may have been disappointed in we the men of God here and there. But can I tell you, hear what the Lord still calls Africa. That great continent. That great nation, South Africa. Now you understand why I started the way I started. If he says it, he will do it. So if he has called Africa the great nation, I want to tell you this. Africa will arise again. But what is the call? I'm wrapping up. Ephesians 5.14 Three quick verses. I want to do something prophetic tonight. Now please pay attention. I'm going to read these three verses. Prophetically. Um, I saw Colin. He's the one I know. That my man. Where is he? He's gone. Yes. You will do me something here when I read these three verses. Please permit my bias. But I want you to sing for me 
the national anthem of South Africa. Hallelujah. Prophetically, it's a chauffeur to the realm of the spirit that from house of treasures, there are bones. Did he not say, as when I prophesied, I heard a sound? Can I tell you this? The blood of many have gone for the gospel. Many today have died. Some of you in ministry do not even know the history of the move of God within your region. It didn't come at a platter of gold. Go and study church history. People cried. They lost their lives. Missionaries came. Some died. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. South Africa, hear the prophetic word. Ministries, business people. Hear what the Lord is saying. Wherefore he saith, It is true that you want to see the next move of God. It is true that the bones can live, but not under any condition. Here is what God is asking you to do. Man of God, businessman, politician, awake thou that sleepest. Awake from that spiritual slumber. Don't give excuses. You will not bear glory that way. Awake. Awake. Some of you need to go back to ministry 101. Some of you need to go back to Christianity 101. And say, honestly, I've not gotten this thing right. I need to make it right. Second scripture, very quickly. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. First Samuel, very quickly, we're out of time. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. 3, 0, 2 and verse 30. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that my house and the house of my father should walk before me forever. But now, the Lord said, be it far from me. Listen, South Africa, another word for you from the Lord. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me, go and read through history. Any region, individual, nation, continent that ever despises God is a matter of time. For you are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. You are God alone. From before time began, you are on your throne. You one more time. You are God, say you are God alone. From before time began, you are on your throne. You are God alone. Second Chronicles chapter seven, popular scripture. That has been used by revivalists from verse 13. Second Chronicles chapter 7 from verse 13 and 14. Second Chronicles 7. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain. Or if I command the locust to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. Next verse. Please read with me in concert. Ready? Read. If, hold on. He's talking to his people. This instruction is not to strangers. They are his people. If my people, which are called by my name, number one, we are looking at the protocol for restoration. Number one, they shall humble themselves. Lord, I accept as an individual. I do not know you. I accept the mistakes that I've made. As a parent, as a pastor, as a leader. There is one thing I know about God. You can use brokenness to attract the attention of God. 
For as long as we continue to act like a people who know what we are doing, even in the midst of our confusion, God will leave us to continue in our pride. He looks for people who are genuinely broken. I don't know about you, but I have learned to come unashamed before God. When I come before Him, I don't come as Apostle Joshua Selman. That's nonsense. Your boy is still here. The one you lifted. The one you took from nothing. Oh God, I am still here. Thank God for the applause of kings and nobles. But may I ever remain that child before you. God is speaking to someone here. We are wrapping up. Humble themselves. Please give us that scripture. Number two, and pray. What kind of prayer do you think you will pray in this occasion? Prayer of genuine repentance. Not some prideful prayer and saying, God, I'm putting my hand in my pocket as your colleague. I've been waiting for you. No, sir. Brokenness. I don't mean to be sarcastic, but I'm showing you a formula. Bones, if you will come back, you must be willing to listen again. It was your lack of listening that depleted you. The prodigal son, for as long as he was under the influence of his father's voice, he experienced so much. When he left and there was no more voice, he depleted till he began to feed with swine. Let's finish up. And seek my face more than money. I believe in prosperity. Oh. Don't confuse what I'm teaching now. I believe in prosperity and its ability to help to give you a life of comfort and to advance the purposes of God. But I love you more than it. Oh, they don't know what you mean to me. They don't know what you mean to me. How could I exalt money more than him? How could I exalt ministry more than him? Where were these things when the devil was almost destroying me? Can I? Listen. God is speaking to us tonight. Some of you, this may be the reason why you have not seen the power and the grace of God. You love him, but how much? Simon Bajona, lovest thou me more than this? Please let's finish up. And turn from your wicked ways. If you pray and don't turn, you are still a sinner. The prodigal son said, ah, He came to himself. Africa, let's come to ourselves. If we want to fulfill that prophetic word of being that continent that will return Christ back, I'm speaking to world over the world. But please permit my bias passionately communicating this to our dear continent. Africa was now feeding with swine. And Africa said, I come to myself. He said, how many hired servants does my father have? And I am here today feeding with swine. I will arise. I cannot change myself, but I can go to where change will happen. I may not be able to save myself, but I can come to church. I may not have the power to drive those demons, but I can come to a man of God who has been graced. He said, I will arise and I will go back to my father. I'm showing you repentance. Repentance requires action. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am not worthy to be called your son. Take me as one of your servants. And the moment he was leaving his place of decadence, the father too was leaving his house. They met somewhere on the way. Can I tell you this? The greatness you are looking for is also looking for you. But he's not looking for the rebel that is at that place. He's looking for the one on his way back. Businessman, hear me. You have tried everything you know to do. It's a spiritual problem. It's not just a financial problem. You have too many friends who would have brought you out. There is a hand that you are against. Then I will hear from heaven. 
and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. South Africa, please stand. Africa Malu Nigeria, Apostle. Apostle Felix Oko is the General Overseer and Senior Pastor of House of Churches.
pray that prayer now. Africa, leave again. South Africa, leave again. Nigeria, leave again. Zimbabwe, leave again. Malawi, leave again. Is someone prophesying? We are declaring, leave again. Leave again. Out of the ashes of our decadence, leave again. The church is praying, leave again. Putting aside our denominational barriers, we come as a people who love Jesus and we speak all oh, dry bones, leave again, leave again. In politics, leave again. In business, leave again. Economically, leave again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let our children begin to call upon the name of the Lord again. Hallelujah. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bore him set. And men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Cry before him. Cry before him. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now please listen carefully. Apologize for the stretch. But the last thing I'm going to do here tonight. There are people scattered inside. And probably the other halls that have been put. We cannot end this conference without giving you room to make it genuinely right with Jesus. More than a church goer more than a bearer please stand if you can of christian names i apologize for the stretch but this is the protocol that restores the ark if it is god we desire to see again in our land now here's what i'm going to ask you to do all those who are not within this auditorium when the altar call is made please officials if you can just show them somewhere they can stand so we still respect the principles um, as far as um, gatherings and all of that is concerned but for those who are in this hall hearing me preach you're saying apostle I need Jesus desperately as a matter of life and death Christianity is nothing without him or you are here and you are saying I remember giving my life to Jesus but sincerely my life has gone haywire and right now I do not even know what I stand for I need restoration and revival these two groups of people without having to bump on yourselves please come gently and I want you to come and stand at the aisles here I'm going to count one to five please do that quickly if you are still thinking about it sit down on your seat but if you are here and you mean it sincerely please don't pretend this is Jesus some of you are crying. One, please come to Jesus. Please come to Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided. To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. I'm going to hold the hands of your man of God and we're going to be praying for you. You don't have to kneel for, for space. Listen, Jesus said this. Don't be ashamed of your tears. Some of you are crying. You are before him, Jesus. <laughs> The one who can save to the uttermost. In your salvation is the salvation of your children. In your salvation. He says for this promise is unto you. 
and your children and your children's children as many as are far off even those that the Lord himself will call those of you who are in front please lift your right hand high to the heavens and I want you to say this after me let it be from the depth of your heart say after me Lord Jesus tonight I have heard your word I believe that you are the son of God I believe that you died for me I believe that you rose again for my justification tonight I receive you as my Lord my Savior and my King hallelujah please keep those hands lifted your pastor your apostle the shepherd and your father is going to make a declaration over you and when he makes that declaration if there is a place you go to that's fine otherwise I'm sure that there will be a group of counselors or maybe a card given to you or if there is no provision like that whenever we call for those who have made this altar call please do avail yourself so that there will be a group of people who can follow you up praise the Lord yes. Heavenly Father we just want to thank you thank you for each and every one of these souls Father the scripture says there is a rejoicing in heaven over the salvation of one soul therefore Father we thank you for this great harvest Father upon their confession in our Lord Jesus in the resurrection and Father we now declare as a church the scripture says whosoever sins will remit is remitted we declare therefore that their sins are forgiven the grace that brought them out here will preserve them in the kingdom and Father, we decree that unto the coming of our Lord Jesus, everyone here will make it to heaven. We destroy every curse in your life, and I speak the blessing of Abraham into your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we declare you blessed in Jesus' precious name. And everybody say, Amen. Now quickly, you are just going to follow there is a lady right there. Please follow them. We just need to take your name and or your phone number so we can keep in touch with you to help you maintain this decision. What a great harvest of souls. We celebrate all of you. Please, can you just follow them quickly? Just follow them. It's just going to be a short while. Follow them and you'll be back into the service. You, they will give you an, uh, an information form. Fill it out quickly. Please help them. Help them. Please fill it out quickly. Help them. Help them. Some people can go through this way. Can somebody direct them this way? Please don't go back to your seats. Just follow them. Obey instructions. So you can write down your names and your phone number. And we'll be able to follow up with you. And help you to maintain this decision. Please church, one more time. Give them a clap off. Let's celebrate them. Hallelujah. Now, before I take my seat, I understand there is a session. Remember, you can see already the wind of revival is blowing. Amen. Please let me encourage you. Let this conference be a moment of retreat for you. Enter a covenant with yourself that you're not going to miss any of the sessions left. People have traveled from everywhere. We have a session tomorrow. We'll continue from here. And by the grace of God, tomorrow evening will be a miracle service. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I have obtained permission from your man of God to allow everybody, please write down everything that has threatened the name of the Lord over your life. Mm. For you and for your loved ones. Yes, sir. I'd like you to bring it here. By the grace of God, fire will fall from heaven upon this place. We are going to be standing... Listen to me. We are going to be standing under a corporate anointing 
all the servants of God and we're going to trust God that in the name of Jesus there will be such a supernatural flow of, of solutions over the lives of people. Now, please, I'd like you to encourage, even for those who but for any reason may not be able to make it here, they can follow um, on, on all the platforms that are available. The most important thing is that they connect because God is speaking to individuals, to families, to communities, to this nation, this continent, and indeed across the globe. So please make sure that everyone is part of this. The Lord bless you. The Lord honor you. Thank you, sir. In Jesus' name. Cities experience transformation. Nations experience development. And then a time seems to come when they're they will now plunge back to decadence and so on and so forth and I'm a student of revival myself I have studied the moves of God from scripture I have studied the moves of God as as much as I can find in any and every continent in a bit to understand why revivals die why they fail why they cease to last and i've had the honor and the privilege of meeting a few of these revivalists in their lifetime it's an honor that god gave me to listen to them what did god tell you what did you do right where did you miss it the bible says the things that are written are for time they are for our learning so that we through the comfort of scripture might find hope are we learning this morning the first thing i want to tell you is that kingdom advancement is territorial the advancement of the kingdom is territorial that means that god desires that his kingdom be advanced but there is a territorial component to it that means that if south africa does well advancing the kingdom of god Malawi, Nigeria, Africa as a continent, Europe, America, then the whole earth indeed would experience the reality of the life, of the life and the power of God. But if a territory fails to advance the kingdom, it does not matter what else another territory is doing. With time, the inability of that territory to press towards God will affect those who are on fire. Are we together now? Yes. One song from one territory can become the instrument of revival in another territory. One message from one territory can become the instrument of revival in another territory. Territories are spiritually interconnected. That means if one territory is excelling spiritually and another territory is going down, the devil will ship somewhere. He will ship something from that cold territory that will destroy the fire. Every revival died because someone came with an idea and a philosophy from a territory that was antichrist and he doused the fire in the territory where the fire was burning. So it matters. This was the mistake that Esther wanted to make. She seemed safe because she was in the palace. While her man was plotting against the Jews and Mordecai gave her a counsel. He said, don't you think that you are safe forever? You are only safe for a season. If you don't use your influence to advocate our freedom, when he's done with you, he will come back. When he's done with us, he will come to the palace and fish you. And Esther said, no, I will use this opportunity now and go to the king even though uninvited. And if I perish... Perish. Her insistence was what brought to naught the plot of Haman. Kingdom advancement is territorial, and all territories are spiritually interconnected. This is true. There are a few keys that I have learned. The Bible says. In Philippians chapter 2 from verse 13, let's hurry up, just an exhortation. 
Philippians chapter 2 from verse 13 to 16. Here's what it says. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 13. It says, For it is God which walketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Uh huh. It says, Do all things without murmuring or disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world last verse holding forth the word of life that ye may rejoice in the day of christ that i have not run in vain neither labored in vain he says there is a mandate upon us that in the midst of a wicked and a perverse generation that we are mandated to hold that light and to shine it forth so that everyone would see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we've discussed this a bit in previous sessions. Jesus now, Jesus began a discourse with the disciples when he resurrected from the dead. The Bible says he was with them 40 days teaching them on the matters of the kingdom. And they thought he was going to restore the nation of Israel. And they asked him a question. They said, will you at this time restore the nation of israel he said it is not for you to know the times and the seasons that the father has put within his care verse 8 now says but ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you and that power will make you witnesses validators of my claim and now he creates a territorial component to that assignment you will be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth our mandate listen to me our mandate as far as preserving the move of God is to ensure that God and his purposes remain alive within a territory transgenerationally let me repeat that we have a corporate mandate as the church in any territory to ensure and insist that God and his purposes remain alive. Not just within our lifetime, but transgenerationally. South Africa, hear me. That means if Christ tarries, a time should never come in this nation where the subject of God becomes obsolete. You have an assignment to preserve God and his purposes transgenerationally now i know people are falling from all over the world but respectfully speaking across europe across many parts of the west today spirituality has plunged into an unfortunate dimension and let me tell you what happened in the 60s and the 70s please pay attention when great generals, those who call God's generals, these mighty men of God were, were trailing that entire environment with the fire of revival. There was a mistake that they made that we should not make. Africa, please listen to me. They made a mistake. They ignored the generation after them. They were focused on blessing people. They were on crusade grounds, healing the sick, raising the dead. But they left their little toddlers who are now the leaders. Remember, that was the strategy that the spirit of the Antichrist was trying to bet in Egypt. He said, we will allow you go, but leave your wives and children. Moses said, no way. All of us will go. Our future will go with us. Our support systems will also go with us. Let me tell you this. When the devil tries to stop the move of God, in the lifetime of a man when he finds out you have an unbending covenant with god and you will not change the next strategy is to distract you so that you are so focused in the work that you forget that one day you will not be here many of them ignore their children and so the antichrist said you know what Give up on this prayer warrior woman, she will never backslide. Give up on this evangelist, she will never go down. But let us go back and pay the price for the next 30 years growing with their children. Now the Antichrist grew with the children. 
now you call the name of Jesus, they tell you nonsense. I didn't grow with that name. Why are you now introducing it in my adulthood? The Bible says, train up a child. Not train up an adult. He knows why he says train a child. It is difficult to train an adult. Preserving the move of God. Pay attention. It's a mistake. Now, we honor the West. Don't get me wrong. We, we remain indebted to them for the dimension of God and the Christian faith that they so lavishly brought to us. However, we are learning from that mistake. Are you aware that the average teenager right now, I don't know how it is in South Africa, but the average teenager completely ignores and hates anything that has to do with God. They love IT, they love apps, but you mention God and it's as though you are mentioning a typewriter. They say, get out of my way, I'm not interested in all this nonsense. It's a subliminal programming. The Bible says, there arose another Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. So South Africa, my final word to the body of Christ in this territory in this season is that i want to teach you and give you six keys that the lord gave me very quickly if you hold on to these keys i give you an assurance by the god of heaven that hundred years from now jesus will still be lifted in this territory you see quality control systemic quality control is the key to preserving the consistency of products in business we teach that is that true yes there's an apple drink that i love organic wonderful apple drink i think it's from the u.s and most times when i take it they started in i think 1886 that was where they started the company 1886 and they are still working today they have they have done well to maintain the quality do you know why because they created a systemic nature of quality control that does not depend on the individual man in it we must create such a system in south africa question is there a system to make sure sinners are saved like i taught you is there a system to make sure the saved are transformed is there a system to make sure the transformed are empowered is there a system to make sure the empowered are preserved through character and humility? If you lose that formation, you have lost it. Let's do a one minute recap over what I taught yesterday. The greatest need of a non-believer. Come on, talk to me intelligent people. The greatest need of a non-believer. The greatest need of a new believer transformation the greatest need of a transformed believer empowerment the greatest need of an empowered believer character and humility and when you are there you recycle it back again back to jesus again it starts and ends with him if you don't find jesus at the end of your pursuit you are missing it somewhere you should find him at the beginning and at the end he brings you back the beginning and the end. Are we together? Six keys. I have studied this in the life of territories where godliness has been preserved transgenerationally. Let me give you the keys very quickly. Are you ready? Number one. For the move of God to be preserved in South Africa, you must ensure that the priesthood ministry of prayer never goes down. Write it down, please. The priesthood ministry of prayer. Notice, prayer does many things. And prayer was allocated to achieve many things. The primary purpose of prayer is not just to receive things. The primary purpose of prayer is for your transformation. There is a dimension of prayer that is for receiving petitions. There is a dimension of prayer that is for warfare and intercession. Please hear me. If you lose the priesthood ministry of prayer at a territorial scale, I assure you the power of darkness will ravage the land and destroy anything God. In the land of Babylon, 
there was only one request one request that because of the prayer of daniel the spirits of the medis and the persians could not penetrate to thwart the purposes of god and so satan walked through the members of parliament to pass just one law you would think they were just discussing it was about attacking the priesthood of prayer and they came up with a proposal let there be no prayer in the whole land of babylon for just 30 days that's only that's how short satan needs a land without prayer to wreck havoc 30 days without priests who can pray the priesthood ministry of prayer the fire upon your altar south africa must not go down please hear me prayer is not for prayer warriors prayer is for men he spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray if you do not pray you cannot authorize the hand of god to rest upon a land and birth his purposes you have to understand the rules of engagement god is almighty but he the earth has he given to the sons of men The Bible tells us clearly that the whole world lies in wickedness. It is no news that the devil will want to wreck any family, any industry, any business, any church, if allowed. Are we blessed? Listen, you must never stop initiating prayer chains. You must never stop initiating prayer groups. There are some of you who God has anointed to be intercessors. Men and women, now is the time to put on your priestly regalia. A destiny is at stake. A generation is at stake. Oh, awake wailing women. Awake men and women who know how to hold on to the four horns of the altar. Preserve the next hundred years of South Africa now. Are we together? It says, give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem as a praise. Everything that happens physically is something that has been concluded in the realm of the spirit. The book of Job teaches us that. Nothing just happens. The ministry of prayer. Churches pray pastors pray don't just preach pray 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 and fast pray not pray alone pray and fast south africa pray and fast these are the irrefutable keys that control the move of god the keys that control revival prayer and fasting it will never change it has never changed pray in the morning pray in the afternoon pray in the evening pray all across south africa let every home become a house of prayer pray with your children pray with your husband pray with your wife pray with your workers businesses pray companies pray industries pray members of parliament pray Listen to me. I charge every father here. You are not just a father because you provide bread. You are a father if you lead prayers. Not just participate in the prayers. Lead it. Show your children how to be a spiritual man. Listen. I look forward to times in South Africa where a family may be it's night time and they've gone to bed and they hear the voice of their father as the priest of the house from the living room to the kitchen and you open the door and lay hands on your children when they wake up you say no sleep i'm performing my priestly duty you sleep i'm awake for you let me see the devil that comes to destroy your children when you are a man of prayer 
Let me see the devil that comes to destroy your business when you are a man of prayer. Instead of complaining, pray. Instead of complaining, pray. The same energy it takes to complain is the same energy it takes to pray. Can I tell you this? An attack on your prayer life is a real attack. Let me repeat South Africa. An attack on your prayer life is a real attack. Don't give excuses and say, I am busy. When you are sick and down, everything you are trying to do, you will not be able to do again. Don't let the devil destroy your territory. Let him know there are priests in South Africa. Fortify the spiritual borders of your territory. Be the watchman on the wall. Stand. He says, I have set watchmen. Every pastor here, you must get to a time where you lock the church and you are the only one there. I'm, hear what I'm telling you. I'm teaching you secrets in the kingdom. Lock your church and be the only one there. No usher, no protocol. Just you and God. Lord for your glory. Lord for your purposes. Can I tell you this? If you give your children a good degree and you don't give them God and transfer priesthood, you did not complete your investment in them. Don't just give them education. Give them spirituality. Don't just give them education. Give them spirituality. The priesthood ministry of prayer. We got into this work by prayer. We have been preserved by prayer. Please hear me. If you do not fast, you will remain weak. The good old school art of fasting has been the key to strength and stamina in the spirit. This kind goeth out not, but by prayer and fasting. There are issues that you need to confront with prayers and fasting. Fasting does not kill. Turn that plate upside down and come before God. Please sit down. This is supposed to be a charge. <laughs> Preserving the move of God. Pastors, let me give you an advice. Be careful with the deception of being busy in ministry. Be careful. When Sometimes when the devil wants to destroy you, he will allow so many invitations to come into your life. There is a skill to honoring so many invitations and still remaining on fire. I am busy and busy has destroyed many people. You must learn to wake up in the night. Use your nights. When people are asleep and there's no distraction, you wake up. You are hearing a report in your job that is not pleasing. Carry your CV and drop it on the ground. Someone tells you in the office, over my dead body for you to rise. Don't fight him. Go back to your control room. Hear me. James 5.15 Please let's hurry up. We came to church this morning. James chapter 5 and verse 15. Hmm. <laughs> James 5 verse 13 I meant to say. 13. Please read. 1, 2, read. Is any among you afflicted? What is the cure? Let him pray. The moment you find out that there is any form of affliction, your first port of call is not to discuss and call people who cannot help you. There is a control room that we have. The advantage of priesthood. You can manipulate realities to be consistent with the word of God. 
when you know to pray how do you think we rise in this kingdom in the midst of wickedness how do you think we rise how are you going to call partners to your ministry dear man of god it won't be by giving invitations right from where you are your kingdom come your will be done and right now i pray those who have been called into the ministry of prophetic intercession i stretch my hands over you may that grace come upon you right now may that grace come upon you Deborah, arise elijah arise men and women of power some of you from this conference you will start prayer groups prayer chains prayer chains across territories in the name of jesus christ Listen to me. You are in ministry here. Please sit down. You are in ministry. Let me give you an advice. There are two departments you should supervise yourself. Number one is your worship team. Your worship team. You must put an eye on them by yourself. Because when the ministry of psalmistry dies in your ministry, you are in trouble. Number two, the prayer department. Every man of God must be a member of his prayer department. Whether you have the time to physically be there or not, you must connect in the spirit. Pray for me, pray for me will make you a weak man. You want to preserve? Listen, let me tell you this. Apostle Felix, Jesus is teaching and here's what he said he said when a spirit leaves a man listen carefully that that spirit goes through dry regions is it in your bible and he said seeking for a place of refuge you will find none and he will say i will go back he's still calling that man my house i will go back to my house and he finds the house swept clean but empty now look up let me share with you a mystery the demon did not just leave the man by default. It was casted out by an agency of God's power. Is that true? But it goes to the wilderness where there is no prayer warrior and no one to cast it. And yet it is uncomfortable there. What makes it uncomfortable? I found out that the desert is very hot. The heat there in the desert can make that demon uncomfortable. And without any man casting it, it will leave the desert and choose to come back to you. That means if your body can become like that desert, if that fire that burns within you, Sanakapakatos, if that fire that is in that temple can burn like the desert, every spirit, every cause, every charm, every yoke, every spell will let you go. Listen down. Jesus said, My house shall be called the house of of prayer that house is not just a building you are that temple that house if you are not the house of prayer you will become a den of robbers so satan will come to that house which is you since you are not a house of prayer he will steal your joy he will steal your faith he will steal everything he can steal Number two, what is the second key that will preserve the move of God in South Africa, in Africa, and across the globe? Are you ready? The second key, the regular convergence of believers within that territory to be trained, equipped, and empowered. The regular convergence you want to preserve the move of God there must be a regular convergence of believers within a territory for the purpose of training the purpose of equipping the purpose of being empowered this is why coming to church is very important there must be a regular convergence listen to me when Satan wants is the purposes of God to be thwarted something happens with the convergence of believers the regular convergence of believers 
there must never be an end to conferences services weekly meetings apostolic and prophetic platforms that bring believers together because it is God's authorized platform to train to equip and to empower please hear what I'm telling you that means when believers begin to have the laxity to go to the house of God it's not an attack on those believers it's an attack on the territory you are only receiving what you are receiving because you are converged right now in a Sunday service. Can I tell you this? I beckon on you by the mercies of God. Train your children to love the house of God. Train your children to love the house of God. Train your children to serve in the house of God. Train your children to be genuinely connected to the house of God. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God, David said. There must be a regular convergence of believers. When the gathering of the saints is affected indefinitely across any territory, do you know, respectfully speaking, I know that world over there was a lockdown last year especially do you know how many believers spiritual lives went down Come on now. just within a span of three months now of course i know that the, the government and the nations did their best to manage but i'm saying that such a situation where at a global scale almost every nation was on lockdown for three months people returned back to their vomits people who pastors were laboring to manage to stand strong had a license to go back people's prayer lives went down people left god the devil used the opportunity to attack those he had been trying to attack who were under prophetic coverings for a long time by the time the lockdown was over there were too many casualties already the house of god is a place of inspiration the house of god is a place where you will learn the word the house of god is where you encounter the god of heaven the house of God is God's authorized institution to mentor and build believers to become like God. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It says it's like the oil that comes upon the head of Aaron down to his bird, down to his skirt. It says, For there the Lord hath commanded the blessing. There must be a regular convergence. That means you must pray that anywhere in South Africa where there are no churches and meeting places that call upon the name of the Lord, you must pray that God will send laborers there. Amen. The unreached must be reached. Yes, there is always an apostle among the unreached. There is always a prophet among the unreached. There is always a kingdom financier among the unreached. You must give them a chance to know God. Number three. What is the third key? Are you ready? You want to preserve the move of God in South Africa? There must be an open display of the power of God within your land. An open display of the miracle working power of God miracle signs and wonders do not tell people to come to a god whose power they cannot see That's right. That's right. by the time the newspapers in south africa are full of the wonder working power of god that the headline on the newspaper is that a popular madman who is known everywhere in south africa has now become a pastor that is too notable to ignore. By the time five dead people medically confirmed come back to life. By the time someone who is obviously oppressed or whose family is down, maybe in parliament, one of the kings within the territory receives the power of God. Their endorsements will preserve the purposes of God. Can I tell you this? If people do not see the power of God, they will soon forget about God. 
the power of God reminds people that he's alive. Please hear what I'm telling you. This is very important. I'm just listing them. I apologize. We may not talk so much about scriptures. Miracles create convictions in the hearts of those who witness it and those who benefit from it. It lets people know that he's still seated on the throne. We live in a world right now where there are many alternatives. There are about 4,000 registered religions. Are you aware of that? And counting. So when you say God, people say, what are you talking about? God means anyone and anything I respect. Ah, but he says, this is eternal life. John chapter 17 and verse 3. That they may know you, the one true God and Jesus your son. John 4 and verse 48. Except they see signs and wonders, he says, they will not believe. John 4 48 except they see they want to see the power of God to save they want to see the power of God to heal to deliver they want to see the power of God to bless the power of God to transform remember what happened to the jailer remember that story is that true Paul and Silas the Bible says at midnight they began to pray and to sing and everybody in the prison had them suddenly his majesty just came not an angel he came himself there was such an earthquake the chains broke and the bible says all doors open how many doors when he comes there is not one door that remains all they prayed and they sang in prison, bound with chains. And when his majesty stepped in, with an earthquake, all doors opened. And the jailer thought that they had run. And he took a sword wanting to kill himself. And Peter said, find your peace. And Paul, find peace. We are here. We are safe. There's no need to rush. God who did it can do it again. We are going to go out honorably. And the man said, no, I have not seen it this way. What do I need to do? And he says, now you are talking. Can I tell you this? South Africa, your territory needs to see a consistent display. Not once a year. A consistent display. Not just a display of power in church alone. They need to see the power of God. By the time... A man of God declares that there will be a bumper harvest. And strangely, the agricultural sector in South Africa receives a boost that is inexplainable by the agriculturists, the economists. They say, We've not seen it in this fashion. Then they know there is a God in heaven. An open display of the supernatural power of God. Don't tell people to stop going to herbalists and native doctors if you cannot give them a superior alternative. Can I be honest with you? People will continue to run to the devil until the day we present an alternative that is consistent, superior, and result producing. The desperation of human needs will not allow them to forbear with nonsense. Once they go through pain beyond the threshold, they will source for alternatives and unashamedly bow to those alternatives. To see you high and lifted up, you are shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. We'll see you high and lifted up over South Africa, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy ho. One more time, South Africa. We'll see him high and lifted up. 
He is shining in the light of His glory. Pour out Your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. This is why men and women of God must trust God for superior levels of end time anointings. The mantles that men like Smith Wigglesworth prophesied upon before they died. They said even what we have done, there is coming a generation that will do more. The general said it before they died. But I know that after this conference, because this conference is a trigger, suddenly you will begin to hear of men and women across South Africa, men of character and men of fire. You will begin to hear about the manifestations of the power of God in church services that will dumbfound principalities and powers. You will hear that fire wanted to consume a house but nothing was burnt. When they say we don't believe this, refer them to the burning bush. That it is possible for a bush to be burned yet not consumed. That a day will come when wild worship is going on in church. Someone who has been missing for 10 years, 15 years, the power of God will leave that altar and the fire like a tornado will go and fish that person back days will come when a church is empty no conference and you will see sinners run into the gate and they will hold on to the gate and say create a fresh service for us we are coming to Jesus times will come where business people will finish their meeting and while they are in their meeting about to round up the power of the Holy Ghost will fall upon that meeting and you are watching senior executives under the anointing praying in the spirit I don't know the name of what is happening to me but I know that it's a new season you will see people in marketplaces receiving an outpouring students sitting in an exam hall and when they are done writing their exams fire falls upon them someone shall send the fire someone shall send the fire shall send the fire let's sit down we're almost there preserving the move of God can I tell you this have you noticed that from scripture every time there was a display of the power of God it was captured and preserved in a name and they will be told when your children ask you what does this mean tell them once upon a time how do you think they got Shama and Rafa and Sikenu there were all dimensions of his power that were captured in his name can I tell you this the assignment of every generation is that you should not leave to your grave until you give the coming generation a new name that your experience has captured about God South Africa the generations coming all of you who are from 50 and above what name have you captured in your lifetime that will be given the children capture the names in songs that don't die capture the names in books that don't die capture the name in sermons that don't die the God of Abraham is also God but he does not walk the same as the God of Isaac there is a dimension of the God of Abraham that is not seen in the God of Isaac and when Jacob came he said I need to give God a name too he wrestled with him and said I will not let you go leave me for the day break it he said I will not let you go unless you bless me he said what is your name Jacob thou shall no longer be called Jacob 
for as a prince you have had power with God and you have prevailed he touched the whole of his thigh and he blessed him the Bible says the sun arose and he called the name of the place Peniel I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved by the time we get to Psalm 24 he says this is the generation of them that seek thee O God of Jacob that a day will come you will see the faithfulness of God and one day you will teach your children and say every time you are in trouble and it looks like the battles are raging there was a song I sang in 1981 before you came that is a song of victory that is like a code in this family you are good and your mercy is forever hallelujah do you know that was a song that was a code of victory every time the nation of israel were surrounded by their enemies and defeat was imminent they raised that song you are good and your mercy endures and god is saying who is calling my dimension as a warrior clear the way for me please let's hurry up <laughs> number four are you ready the fourth way you preserve the move of God across a territory across South Africa. Are you ready? Intentional mentorship of younger believers and ministers. Intentional and methodical mentorship of younger believers. Now you see what your pastor did with Pastor Colin here. Intentional mentorship of younger believers. Younger believers there don't just mean younger pastors, younger businessmen, younger politicians. Fathers across different fields, fathers across different industries, fathers in ministry. Don't just collect seed from your sons, mentor them. Don't just do impartation for them, teach them the road to the anointing, teach them the road to power. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Very quickly. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. We're wrapping up. Second Timothy 2 and verse 2. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Read with me. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Can I tell you this? When Smith Wigglesworth, listen carefully, when Smith Wigglesworth was preparing to join the cloud of witnesses, he told Lester Sumro, he said, when you are old, do not die with this mantle. Find young men, train them, impart upon them. Today, we are privileged recipients of that baton because the fathers allowed to train us many of you have heard of my encounter with dr miles munro a greatly revered mentor in life and in death i honor him even in the grave do you know when god began to show me that i was called into ministry i wrote many men of god then there were no phones and Dr. Miles Munro was the only man of God who replied me back and written. He said, I believe in you. I believe in this and that. And I read his books. And God guided me. I remember I was at the southern part of Nigeria preaching in a conference that morning. Literally, I began to feel a sharp pain across my chest. I said, what is going on? And by 5 a.m. Nigerian time, I was told that my greatly revered mentor had gone. But I said, no, even though he's dead, he still speaks. We are the continuation of his impact. Fathers, immortalize your impact by raising sons. 
don't just raise people who call you father raise people who replicate your values can i tell you this please fathers in business in ministry don't allow these young people to stand up and just do what they want to do you are a father discipline them in love teach them love their future more than your reputation they may not understand chastise them in righteousness not out of a wicked heart let them learn the law of process minimize premature manifestation let them stay until something called due season the casualties we have in the body of Christ today is because of some of these premature manifestations. You are a young man here in ministry, listen to me. Just because you can heal the sick, you can prophesy, does not mean you are ready for ministry. Can I tell you, what you call pulpit ministry is only 30% of what ministry really is. There is a skill to stand in here. It's a very slippery path. If you, do, if you are not trained to stand, you can fall. South Africa, respect your fathers, not because they are perfect, but because they are sincere. When the devil wants to destroy a territory, he kills the fathers. And woe betides a nation that does not have political fathers. You do not have political fathers. The younger ones will become a worse expression of the fathers. You don't have fathers in ministry. South Africa, you know that the church in this nation is going through sharp transitions. Can I tell you, pray that God will raise fathers indeed. Businessmen, don't just die with billions and have children argue and have people argue over your money transfer your values to younger people professors don't be the only professor you know raise people raise people raise people can i challenge you if you are a professional in any area here you have failed if within 10 years of your moment of exploit you cannot show at least two people who are becoming like you 10 years from the time of your exploits if you cannot produce at least two people even if they have not arrived let's see how far they have come can I be honest with you if you are the only one who is the champion doing what you are doing the day the devil strikes you there will be nobody to support you this is why nations lose their treasures with the death of just one person you can cheat death when you transfer yourself to many people. I pray you are learning something here. Number five. How do we preserve the, the purposes of God and the move of God in South Africa? Are you ready for the fifth point? Embrace influence. Embrace influence. Don't run away from influence. There are two ways, principally, that the kingdom of God advances. Number one is called evangelism. Number two is called influence. Evangelism establishes the purposes of God in the hearts of men. Influence establishes the purposes of God across a territory. If you have evangelism without influence, you will have people who are saved, but they will remain beggarly as far as the territory is concerned. You need influence. Let me define influence. Here is my definition of influence. Influence is the ability to compel men to buy into your ideologies without using force or cruelty. The ability, the fortitude to compel men to buy into your ideologies, your value systems, without using force or cruelty. If I can make you love God the way I love Him, if I can make you pray the way I pray, if I can make you love a decent life the way I love, without using force or cruelty, I have influenced you. Can I be honest with you? Be careful who influences you. You will always become like the influence. 
This is the reason why we must pray that God himself will raise kingdom-minded, born-again, tongue-talking people in politics, in business, in government. It is my prayer. I'm not the kind of man of God. I made a covenant with God that I will never raise a people who are only spiritually on fire. In order of priority, their spiritual life are my primary focus. However, they must be people of influence. I believe in influence. If you do not have the people of God represented in your parliament, your businesses, one day there will rise a pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And your work of 30 years will end under the ungodliness of one man. I believe in influence. There must be someone in the security sector who can be a representation of the purposes of God there. There must be someone in your justice system who loves Jesus sincerely. I'm not talking of religiosity and I'm not just talking of favoring Christians. I'm talking of bringing forth the value system of the kingdom such that everyone benefits, both Christians and non-Christians. The value system of the kingdom does not benefit Christians alone. It benefits all of God's creation. This is what I'm teaching. Your universities and your higher institutions of learning must have professionals who also bow to the Lordship of Christ. So that in addition to secular enlightenment, they bring people to a life of decorum and power and spirituality. Are we learning? South Africa and South African churches standing on this platform, I beseech you men of God by the message of God, teach your people the principles of influence greatness is important listen to me the body of Jesus is hanging on the cross there now Jesus Christ died on the cross but he was not supposed to remain on the cross yet nobody had the influence to bring that body down no prayer warrior could bring that body down. It took a man of influence called Joseph of Arimathea. He used his influence with government to say, bring that body down. I have a virgin tomb. If he did not donate his tomb through influence, you will not be able to say, oh death, where is your sting? And oh grave, where is your victory? Influence played a role in our salvation. Believe in prosperity. Believe in increase. Believe in greatness. For as long as the church is surrounded by men and women of influence who have kingdom at heart, there is only so much the devil can do. Influence. Don't just teach people to fast alone as much as I've said it. Don't just teach people to pray alone. Teach people to translate the values of the God life into a context of honor and dignity that the world can see that you have utilized kingdom tools, the weapons of victory to produce a destiny that is enviable. When God granted me the anointing and the grace to raise and to mentor and to build kings and nobles i said thank you for this grace why because for every king to function in a land there must be a priestly and a prophetic cover the formation of king priest and prophet is an old ordinance that will not change woe betides a professional or a king who stands alone in politics and government and does not have the prophetic and the priesthood to protect them Number six, are you ready? How do you preserve the move of God in South Africa? The sixth and the final key, there must be an open display of love. An open display of love without prejudices, without religious biases, without cultural biases. There has to be an open display of of love can i be honest with you until there is love there is a dimension of evangelism called evangelism through love where it is the love that is the preacher and my goodness love preaches well it is love does not need an interpreter 
you preach love everybody will hear and understand church of the lord jesus christ if you cannot show your people love if a preacher cannot show people love if a government can't show people love if your systems and your structures cannot show people love then i assure you sooner or later the reality of the faith life will fade away the advantage we have in the faith life is that christianity is the advocate of love. you are my disciples not when you heal the sick not when you raise the dead not when you pray in tongues not when you prophesy he says though i speak with tongues of men and of angels and i have not love i am nothing even if i offer my body to be burnt and i have not love i am nothing though i know all mysteries i have all prophecies and i have not love i am nothing he says love is patient love is kind love is humble it endures all things it hopes all things love there remain at this three faith hope and love but the greatest is love in first corinthians chapter 12 as i round up after teaching us on the gifts of the spirit prophecy miracles he said behold i show you a more excellent way there is a more excellent way of preaching preaching by love there is a more excellent way of prophesying prophesying in love there is a more excellent way of governance governance in love there is a more excellent way of learning learning in love love never fails please repeat this after me love never fails one more time love that means if you find anything failing add love to it and it stops failing immediately if a nation is failing add love to it the bible says love never fails you find a preacher that is failing had love love never fails business people that's a strategy you want to know what is fail proof and the bible already tells you that love never fails so when you invest in love next time you are listing your investments don't just list telecom real estate add love and it will only take an unwise person to laugh at you what are your investments i have investment in real estate i have an investment in oil and gas i have investment in this i have investment in love really yes sir because no eye has seen no ear has heard neither has it come into the heart of any man that which god has in store not for prayer warriors not for fasting giants not for effective preachers them that love him he says how can you say you love god that you have not seen when you dislike your neighbor who you have seen south africa this is my final word for you in this season africa divided we fall but united we stand all hands together please stand up if you can hold hands with someone please do lord make us instruments of your peace where there is hatred let your love increase lord make us instruments of your peace walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instrument of peace and with our hands lifted up we will worship our king and with our hands lifted up we come before you rejoicing with our hands lifted up to the sky and the world wonders why 
We'll just tell them we love in our King. Oh, we just tell them we love in our King. I did this at the beginning of the conference. Please lend me one minute. Even if it's just the first part of your anthem, Colin, can you do that for me in one minute? I'd like to end my session honoring your nation, South Africa, by singing once again the anthem of your nation. Please. Kosi Sigeleli Africa Malu Paganisu Pondo Layo Iswa Imitanda Zoye Tu Go Si Si Gele watching our entire video today. If you feel you can bless someone, please join us and spread the gospel by sharing this video on your social media.